Yeah? OK. Welcome, everyone. We're ready to start. Tech, tech is working. <laughs> Welcome, as I was saying, and thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure uh, to see you all today here. And uh, I hope you enjoy our symposium on engineering biology that we are running uh, today. As you have seen the program, we have a very exciting list of events throughout the day, ending with a highlight annual lecture for our institute. So we are IMSI, the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering. We are one of the global challenge institutes of the college and work with the remit to facilitate and promote interdisciplinary work throughout the college and beyond. And so in IMSI specifically, we are interested in problems where molecules and, uh, and understanding innovation at molecular level has an impact at engineering and function level. So that's what we do. The institute is very broad in what we do. And each year, we highlight different areas that are exciting and are up, up and coming and where grand challenges are yet to be addressed and discovered. And it's really a pleasure, as I said, to have today a day of events on engineering biology, which really is a perfect point of highlight of how interdisciplinarity between areas has a lot to contribute to, to future science. So thank you, uh, all, as I was saying, all of you for being here. A special thanks to all the speakers of today. I hope you enjoy the day. And before I introduce our first speaker, just to tell you this is a hybrid event. Tech is working. Uh, there will be questions after the talks, as usual. And for those of you joining us online, please put your comments or your questions uh, on the comments box, and the team here will, will pick them up. OK? So with that, I can't remember if I introduced myself or not. Did I introduce myself? I think I did. Anyway, I'm, I'm, in case I didn't, because sometimes I forget, I'm Amparo Galindo, and I'm the chair of the institute. OK, so with that, let me welcome uh, Karen Sarkisian. He is the co-founder of LightBio and head of the, of the synthetic biology group here at Imperial in the Faculty of Medicine. Again, you know, this demonstrates the interdisciplinarity of the work that we do. And uh, Karen, it's a pleasure to have you here. I will let you run through your title and your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Lon, for inviting me. Um, my talk today is about genetically encoded bioluminescence. And actually, is, is it possible to dim the lights a little bit? Because most of the slides are dark. So I will start with a clip from the Avatar film. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So this is a clip from the Avatar film, which is essentially, I think, the largest budget movie about bioluminescence. And <laughs> In the Avatar, there is this planet Pandora, where there is an amazing ecosystem uh, which is full of bioluminescence. You can see bioluminescent plants, bioluminescent fungi there, bioluminescent animals. It plays a big role in communication between the organisms. You can see examples of light-based computation in that ecosystem. And the, if we're doing engineering biology, the question is, can we do this kind of stuff here on Earth, can we engineer organisms to glow in the dark? The real answer is not yet. We don't have a good technology yet, but we're getting there. And essentially my talk today is an update on how this technology has developed over the last years and how, where we are in terms of our ability to engineer bioluminescence. So we also have quite a lot of bioluminescence, of course, on Earth <laughs> and um, different Organisms, they glow for different biochemical reasons. They all make some molecule which, when oxidized by air, emits light. But in, in between the thousands of species that we have that glow in the dark, there is about 40 different biochemically different and evolutionarily different bioluminescence systems. So they all make different molecules, but all those molecules are substrates for this final bioluminescence reaction. Um, and if we want to engineer new organisms to glow in the dark, we need to understand the biosynthetic pathways on, that lead to production of that molecule in the cell from some core cellular metabolites. So the key question is how to produce the substrate for luminescence in the new organism. 
And surprisingly, out of you know, there's thousands of species that we have, we only understand enough just two pathways. Um, one comes from bacteria. This is one, the one on the left. It's actually been known for about 40 years now. It's encoded in uh, what's called Lux operon, six genes clustered together in the bacterial genome. Uh, and it's essentially, biochemically, it's a branch of fatty acid metabolism. The other one was discovered more recently. It's uh, the pathway from some tropical fungi. There's about 100 species of fungi, mostly in the tropical forests, and they encode also some kind of a genomic cluster with four genes which encode four enzymes that catalyze this pathway. And this pathway, biochemically, is a part of phenylpropanoid metabolism. We work on both uh, pathway engineering of both pathways, uh, but this work has gone a bit further, and so I will mostly talk about the application and engineering of the fungal bioluminescence pathway. You can see the chemistry of the pathway here at the center. It's called caffeic acid cycle. It starts with caffeic acid, which is converted to this compound called hispidin in a series of reactions, all catalyzed by one huge enzyme called hispidin synthase, HISPAS here. Hispidin is then oxidized to produce that molecule that actually gives light, so the substrate of luminescence reaction called free hydroxyhispidin. It's oxidized by luciferase enzyme to emit light to produce oxaluciferin, which is then very nicely recycled back into caffeic acid. And so it's a cycle that essentially converts the energy of the plant into light. And immediately when we saw the chemistry of it, we thought, you know, it's, it's almost plant metabolism if you look at it. So here on the slide, you see plant metabolism in white and fungal pathway in blue. And you can see there is a, there is a lot of overlap already. So the idea was maybe we could just overexpress a few genes and that will be enough to make plants glow in the dark. And that's exactly what happened. So we overexpressed a few genes in tobacco plants and we got plants that were glowing continuously in the dark, bright enough to be visible uh, to a naked eye with some eye adaptation. And essentially they, they were glowing throughout their lifespan from germination uh, to flowering. And that was very, very encouraging. And also the fact that we could image those plants, not on this high-end you know, luminescence imaging equipment, which costs usually hundreds of thousands of uh, pounds, uh, but we could just use normal cameras, uh, which are like hundredfold cheaper to image that. Which means that in the lab, you don't have to invest so much in your imaging experiment. You can buy a lot of those cheap cameras and scale it and run many experiments in parallel. So we're thinking maybe that's a good system to actually create a platform technology for all kinds of imaging tasks to image molecular physiology at the level of the whole organism. And it's especially important for plants because in plants you cannot really use fluorescence-based approaches, which are very good nowadays and very popular. But in plants, as you can see here, this is a plant on the UV light. It's all autofluorescent. It's very autofluorescent. It's packed with pigments. If you overexpress your GFP on top of it, you don't get such a good signal, signal to noise ratio. With luminescence, it's different because in, unless you express your luciferase gene, your organism would typically emit zero photons. So there is no background. And with the luminescence system, which is fully genetically encoded in a plant, we, we thought there, there, there could be very different interesting applications. For example, we could potentially monitor the spread of infections in real time. You can imagine a plant that produces the substrate, but then the last enzyme is delivered with a virus, and then you image the spread of viral infection in the plant. Or you can think of plants as sentinel organisms, which light up when they sense something in the environment. Or actually, because you don't need to provide substrate externally, the substrate is produced intracellularly, uh, you can actually move away from the lab and start imaging physiology in the soil, in the real complex ecological environment, uh, which 
hopefully gives us much more relevant information about plant physiology and plant responses. Um, but at the time, if we just you know, had the wild-type fungal pathway, the technology was not robust enough, was not good enough to uh, just be applied to all those stacks. So a few years ago, we kind of made a, a list of things to, to do before it can be actually useful. One thing was to actually make it work in, not, in plants which are different from tobacco, because the wild-type fungal pathway didn't work that well. We also, the whole system was quite big, and so we had to compress it, and we want to compress it, we want to make it very uh, user-friendly. And the other big problem with all those approaches is that if you're interested in understanding the biology of a plant, say, those systems actually don't give you a very quantitative signal. The bioluminescence you're getting back is not just a reflection of gene expression, which you would typically want from your reporter tool. It's also a reflection of activity of cell metabolism. So if a cell is very metabolically active, you would get a lot of substrate, a lot of signal at the same expression level of genes. If it's not, you'll get very dim signal, and then the whole thing becomes very non-quantitative. And so we're thinking about the ways of how to fix this. And finally, the fourth thing on the list was to create those you know, cheap and easy to use imaging devices for, for plant physiology imaging. And so on the first point, um, there's some pathway engineering work and enzyme engineering work led to essentially improved version of this bioluminescence pathway, fungal bioluminescence pathway version three, three we call it. it. We combined, you know, we screened different enzymes from different fungi, found the more active ones, applied directed evolution with our collaborators to improve some of the genes, improve their thermal stability and activity and also figured that we need to express the fifth gene to make it broadly applicable across the plants. And that resulted in this pathway FVP3, which is now we're confident in saying that it's a good enough technology to actually use. You can apply it to Arbidopsis, it works quite well, which is a relatively distant plant from tobacco. Uh, you can apply it to Chrysanthemum, to Actinidia, to Poplar as an example of a tree. So it, it seems to be working quite well in a broad range of plants. And it seems to outperform all the previous versions of the system. <coughs> we also figured how to make this huge enzyme, hispidin synthase, uh, smaller by replacing it with a an en much smaller enzyme from a plant origin, which, which seems to be doing roughly as well, a bit worse but, uh, than the fungal enzyme, but, but still quite well. And so that allows you to really compress this large gene and, and encode the thing in, in a virus, if, if you're interested in imaging viral, viral infections. And on the commercial side of things, the company called LightBio this year brought this plant, uh, petunia plant, to the market. This petunia expresses not even FVP3, it expresses FVP2. Um, and it's a bright enough plant to be a commercially viable product. Here you can see photos. This is the production facility of LightBio. I think it's a good example of what you can expect in the field, right? If you want to create lots of uh, bioluminescent plants and image their physiology in the wild, image their interaction with pests, with pathogens, this is the kind of field you want to have to be able to see the spread of, you know, like so stress response across the field or something like that. Uh, some photos from social networks. But the point I'm, I, I would like to make is that it seems that this technology is bright enough that it allows not only imaging plant physiology at the time scale of the, you know, the whole time uh, lifespan of a plant, it also allows you video rate imaging, to imaging of very quick events in plant physiology. So for example, here's an example of that. Um, uh, this is the reaction, phenylpropanoid activation upon wounding of the plant. You can see quite, kind of quite a quick response of the plant to, to the wounding. Um, here is another example. Um, where we use the bioluminescence system 
um, as a reporter tool for hormone activity. So salicylic acid is a hormone involved in plant stress response to pathogens. And you can see that you know, if you add salicylic acid to the plant that conditionally expresses the bioluminescence pathway, you get great activation of, the, of, of light emission. So one of the big questions is how to actually make this whole thing quantitative. And as I said, you know, the, the, the signal we're getting is not, unfortunately, just the gene expression we're interested in. It's also a function of metabolism. And so the question was how to, how to figure the way to make it, to disentangle gene expression and metabolism in the signal. And we thought we could, this is a, an illustration of how the met metabolism changes light output over time. And the solution we're, we're thinking of is essentially what if we could have two colors of luminescence, identical enzymes, identical catalytic properties, but two different colors, and we just co-express them in the same cell at the same time. And if one enzyme was expressed under a reference promoter and the, the other enzyme is, a, is controlled by a different promoter, uh, the one you're, you're interested in studying, then the ratio of two colors and essentially the, the, the final color of luminescence will reflect the ratio of activity of, of those promoters, but because the enzymes are using the very same substrate, it will be independent of metabolism. So it's kind of a ratio metric sensor for, uh, that allows to disentangle gene expression uh, from metabolism. And as a result, so we're kind of half day there, not, not, not finally there, but it seems to be working. And as a result, you get uh, color change, not light intensity, but color change as a function of whatever you're interested in. And that makes it much more quantitative. Finally, uh, we're, we've also been working on making this um, you know, an easy to use imaging tool. We're designing those rhizodromes where you can grow uh, plants with lots of cameras around them and see both shoot physiology and root physiology at the same time uh, with using these cheap consumer cameras. This is an example. Reminds me of uh, how our streets look nowadays. Um, essentially, those poor Arabidopsis plants, they, they, they grow in this thin layer of soil, which allows you to image the roots quite well. And also the shoot you can image from different angles. I think that's it for, for me today. That's an update. I think we are kind of halfway towards being able to engineer things like you see in the Avatar movie. I think hopefully in the next few years, the technology will be mature enough to engineer much more of that. Thank you. And yeah, just want to say that this is, of course, a hugely collaborative work um, with a major part played by two companies, Planta and LightBio. And um, some other groups, our group at the LMS, Yimpolsky Group, Mission Group, Diego Arzaez Group, Kifut, Promega Advanced Technology Group, Kondrashov Group, and Petrashek Group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can I stay here for uh, questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Do you need. I think if you can wait for a microphone. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, if you can pass him down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the way I'm seeing what your setup is at the moment for reporting on these things, it's going to be expression of your actual proteins, um, which is slower than the signal might actually be there. So have you looked into making hybrid proteins with an actual detector domain and whether that could then detect whatever your stimulus is or a small molecule and then activate the already present protein, whichever one in your pathway? Yes, that's a, that's a great point. So it, it's exactly the problem that yeah, it's transcriptional based reporters so far. Uh, we have tried making some non-transcriptional based reporters, failed. Uh, well, we still want to do that. Uh, part of the problem is that luciferase is a membrane protein, so it's a bit harder to engineer. Also, you don't have access to all the metabolites uh, next to the membrane. Some of them may be compartmentalized in the cell, so that's part of the problem. But yeah, I think that, that should be possible. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It's a re really inspiring talk. Um, so I was wondering, uh, so obviously you've got a challenge about the amount of essentially energy input into the pathway to give you the light, but is there anything in the, in the chemistry, because you're generating uh, excited electronic states, whether there's any sort of uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species, and you know, does it, is this a challenge that is, needs uh, advancing? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a good answer. I think, uh, so we looked at the phenotype of the plants, and uh, with this FVP3, we couldn't detect any, any difference in phenotype. In the original system, we did detect some, some differences. For example, plants that expressing the system were a bit taller for some reason. Uh, we don't fully understand why. Um, but we didn't see any significant kind of burden yet. So maybe we're not at the right level of light emission to see a significant burden. I think those reactions are pretty standard for plant metabolism in general, like the phenylpropanoid metabolism. Um, so I would imagine plants already know how to manage those things, unless it's expressed at the huge levels. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, really cool talk, thank you. Um, you mentioned in the avatar clip something about computation, and I guess I was wondering, is there a pathway to communication with light? So here you're generating the signal, and then with cameras we can measure things, but you know, could organisms communicate uh, with light. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, if you watch the film, you, you know that they, yeah, they used to connect their, whatever it's called, the organ they had here in the, in the hair, right, to the tree, and the tree was bioluminescent, and uh, the thing was bioluminescent. And then they, I don't have a picture, unfortunately, but essentially, I think it's some kind of bioluminescence optogenetic system that was used to communicate with trees. And between animals and trees. So you can imagine like optogenetics in the nervous cells, bioluminescence exciting optogenetics. And there are works now that show that you can excite bio, uh, optogenetic channels with bioluminescence. Uh, just not autonomous bioluminescence yet, but maybe it's just, uh, it's gonna happen in the next few years. So it's, it's possible, it should be possible to engineer communication at the cell level. Um, it's not done yet, uh, the work for autonomous systems. Yeah. I don't know if, you, if I answer. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's, some, it's something that we've thought about and I guess, yeah, yeah struggled with the, the coupling at the moment between uh, luminescent proteins and optogenetic proteins. Um, yeah. So I know it's a difficult We We also thing. had a project like, uh, I think, seven-year project now, which is still unpublished, which, is, which was trying to do something like that. Yeah, so it is difficult. Hi, Karen, I, I think I might have asked you this one before, so apologies if you've already told me. Um, fungi uh, is where you got the bioluminescence from, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then obviously we know lots of animals that do bioluminescence. Why, why do you think plants don't naturally do this? Yeah, that's a good one. I think it's, it doesn't make sense for them, uh, most likely, because I think plants have all the chemistry, all the capabilities to be bioluminescent if they wanted to, if, they, if, they, if there was a reason to evolve it. Uh, and including the precursor of the fungal luciferin, so some plants just naturally produce it. Um, I think as a, as a way to attract pollinators doesn't make much sense because it's very energy intensive and also you're, you end up with only maybe three, four colors as a channel to communication. Whereas we, what we see in evolution of plant pollinator interactions is that there is a lot of specialization, right? You want a molecule that can be sensed one kilometer away from your plant that will attract your specific pollinator and bring it to your to the plant of your species, right? And that, I think bioluminescence just doesn't allow that to do that because you are limited to four, three, four colors. No. Any further questions? No. Do we have any questions online? Yeah, no. Further questions? No, okay. Join me in thanking Karen for a Thank really you. inspiring talk.
Okay, and with this, we welcome our next speaker. Is yeah, Miguel Paez Perez. He is a research fellow in the Department of Chemistry here at Imperial. Thank you for being here, Miguel. And uh, I, I give you the floor. Yeah, the clicker. This is a clicker. So this is your. That's your point. There. Yeah, that's your point there. Um, hello, yeah, I guess this works, so perfect. So thank you very much, I'm Paul for the introduction, and uh, hello everyone. So my name is Miguel, and the topic of my talk uh, today is uh, how we can benchmark uh, optical probes. And this actually relates uh, quite well uh, to what uh, Karen was pointing out before, regarding the need uh, to perform uh, quantitative measurements if we really want to understand uh, what's going on uh, in our system. So in particular, we are interested in, in soft uh, interfaces, in lipid membranes. And the reason of being interested in, in these assemblies is that the uh, lipid membranes um, are quite important in biology. And for example, their biophysical properties uh, will be a, a biomarker of disease or the metabolism uh, going on in, in different organisms. So some of you might be aware that uh, one of the gold standards uh, to measure the biophysical properties of uh, lipid membranes is the use of environmentally sensitive molecular probes. And you can see here that uh, you know, there's a, a wide range of them uh, with uh, different advantages or probing uh, different uh, parts of the membrane, like the head group, the tail, and uh, different uh, physical properties, uh, for example, the charge, uh, viscosity, and, and so on. So in particular today, I will focus on a family of dyes uh, named molecular rotors. And this, uh, these dyes uh, have the advantage, uh, the advantage of being sensitive uh, to viscosity, that is the microenvironmental uh, molecular crowding. So the way they work is uh, shown here. So basically you have this molecule uh, which, uh, which has two different parts and there's an intramolecular motion uh, between these. Now the degree, the degree of this uh, rotation or of this motion is dictated by the molecular crowding around uh, our probe. And therefore, in a lower viscosity environment where there is uh, less crowding, the molecule uh, will uh, rotate faster. And this will be reflected in a lower intensity uh, of the fluorescence and also in a lower li uh, lifetime. And the opposite will happen in a higher viscous environment. You will have higher fluorescence intensity and higher fluorescence uh, lifetime. And very importantly, when we uh, design these probes, we want them to be independent of other confounding factors, such as, for example, temperature, polarity, and, and so on. So the way uh, we start the, our experiments, let's say, is by calibrating uh, the response of these probes uh, to viscosity. And we do it, uh, yeah, as you can see here in this plot, so we can measure the macro viscosity of a solution and then measure the, the response of our probes. In our case, uh, we use fluorescence lifetime because it's independent of concentration, and that already takes out one confounding factor when uh, trying to uh, aim for quantitative results. But nevertheless, what you can see here is that for a given um, viscosity, then we can get uh, multiple uh, fluorescence lifetimes. And the reason is that the degree of molecular crowding, that is microviscosity, is ill-defined usually in uh, bulk solutions. And as you can see here, for example, the response that we get with, uh, with glycerol is not the same one as, the, uh, as, as we get with a higher molecular weight uh, polymer, such as uh, PEG. So this is actually quite relevant when we study lipid membranes, and the reason is that these um, structures are uh, incredibly uh, complex and highly varied. And even if we remove uh, the, the proteins, which are an important uh, component of them, then we end up with a lipid bilayer, which itself is highly heterogeneous. So as you can see here, we have uh, different features. For example, we can have a phase, separate, a phase separation between different uh, lipid domains. Uh, we can also get uh, regions of higher uh, curvature. And we can also as well um, get a asymmetry between the two uh, membrane leaflets. And all of this is uh, introducing confounding factors when trying to um, interpret our results. So here comes the need uh, to benchmark uh, these fluorescent probes in terms of the actual structure of the membrane instead of some calibration that we can do in the bulk uh, in a system which doesn't represent at all the biophysical properties of uh, this bilayer. And we do so by comparing uh, structural uh, data that we obtain from expert uh, diffraction 
Uh, for example, we can use a small angle X-ray scattering to get information about the thickness of the membrane, and we can use wide angle X-ray scattering to get information about the average area that each lipid is occupying uh, within the membrane. And we compare these results uh, to viscosity uh, or lifetime values that we get from our molecular rotors. For example, here a, a potpi dye that uh, sits uh, in the region of the hydrocarbon core or the tail of the lipids. So we can then uh, slowly change the, the temperature, and this allows us uh, to gradually vary uh, the, both the structural properties and the kind of vis uh, viscosity of, of the membrane. And as you can see here, we can get some kind of simple relationships between uh, the structural properties and the viscosity of the, of the membrane as we change temperature. So, of course, this then allows us to establish an analytical relationship between uh, the membrane viscosity that we can measure through optical methods and the structural organization which we measure uh, through X-ray, which of course is uh, not uh, biocompatible, for example, and it will not uh, allow us to obtain uh, spatial information in, uh, of the membrane. And as you can see here on this uh, plot, here on the, on the bottom, we can then calibrate the response using some, some model lipid, for example, the OPC here, and as you can see, the response of uh, other lipids in the same uh, fluid phase uh, will, be, um, uh, will be the same. And therefore, this allows us to use uh, optical imaging in order to infer structural parameters. And here you can see one example. So say we have phase-separated membranes, as this one uh, here on top, uh, which are sorry, representative of uh, those in, in cells. Uh, if we look at the X-ray pattern, then we cannot really distinguish the, the two domains. However, these are very clearly seen in, in FLIM, which is a, a microscopy technique used to measure the, the lifetime of the probe. And then if we uh, do the current transformation uh, of the viscosity values, uh, we can then infer uh, the area per lipid for, for both phases, which actually uh, matches quite well with uh, molecular dynamic simulations as well as uh, those obtained uh, from pure um, X-ray uh, diffraction experiments. And this approach also works uh, quite well uh, with uh, biologically relevant lipids. For example, here you can see that uh, we can use uh, our method in order to infer the area per lipid of uh, E. coli lipid extract. So this altogether gives us confidence on, on our method. So now I will just try to show you another example of how we can use the combined X-ray diffraction and molecular rotors approach in order to reveal uh, non-classical behaviors of, of lipid membranes. So you can think of a membrane as a rubber band, and therefore, whenever you stretch it, for example, using hyposmotic shocks, then the area per lipid will increase, and therefore the thickness will, will decrease, as well as uh, the order and, and viscosity of the lipids will, will uh, be lower as well. And the opposite will happen when we uh, compress the lipids together. So just I will focus, for example, in the hyperosmotic case now, where we press the lipids together. And what we can see is that DOPC, again, this is a lipid in the fluid phase, so pretty much our ideal uh, rubber band. When we squeeze uh, the membrane together, we see an increase in viscosity, which, again, makes sense, because we are pushing all the other lipid molecules together. However, when we have uh, lipids in the gel phase, fully saturated. This means that the lipid molecules are very closely packed together and they cannot compress anymore. If we still apply some pressure, what we see is a decrease in viscosity, which was surprising because this kind of uh, means that the membrane is becoming more disordered as we squeeze it together. So we then decided to do uh, extra diffraction exp uh, experiments, and what we see is that the area per lipid decreases. So we are kind of actually squeezing the, the lipids together, but still we are getting some, some disorder. And the reason uh, for this, uh, we can see it uh, here in the, in the SACS, where we study the difference in, in membrane thickness. So for the rubber band case, the, the DOPC case, we see that the thickness increases, which makes sense. We squeeze something together, then it becomes thicker. However, in the case of DPPC, uh, where the membranes are highly ordered, the thickness uh, goes down. And we believe the reason for this is uh, the existence of this kind of highly curved membranes, uh, which uh, create pockets of uh, regional disorder. And this is actually quite, uh, quite uh, relevant in biology because this process, which I was not uh, experimentally observed before, uh, is thought to play a role uh, in the uh, hearing process uh, happening in the, in the cochlea. So this is just one example, but uh, with this, um, I just wanted to, to give you the following uh, take-home messages, hopefully. 
First, that uh, we can use optical probes, in particular molecular rotors, to quantify the biophysical properties of uh, soft in uh, interfaces with uh, spatiotemporal resolution. But, of course, we cannot rely only on the readout from these uh, optical dyes. We need uh, to use alternative techniques, for example, X-ray diffraction, in order to benchmark the response of these probes. And this will allow us uh, <coughs> sorry, to get a unique insight into the very complex and non-classical uh, behavior of lipid membranes. So with that, I would uh, thank, uh, like to, to acknowledge uh, uh, the Marinas Kumovas uh, Lab, uh, the Membrane Biophysics uh, Group, and uh, the Michaelis Lab, and our collaborators and funders. And of course, thank you for listening. Thank you, Miguel. Very nice, very nice talk. Thank you for a very nice seminar. Uh, any questions? I'll, I'll start with one while they think. <laughs> um, is there any role, there must be, or any works uh, doing molecular simulation of these systems? Yes, so we, we have done MD simulations, okay. I mean, we and, and other groups yes. as well. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that the, the, the dyes in this case sit at different regions of the membrane. Yeah. Uh, which again brings us to the problem of like we cannot really know uh, from bulk uh, from bulk uh, calibration what's the environment uh, that the dye is sitting in, and yeah, in general, like for every uh, for, for every measurement that we do, we need to do MD simulations or like some other kind of um, uh, theoretical approach in order to have an insight on whether the probe location will influence uh, and to what extent uh, the readout from from these probes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because it seems like we're going from like you're showing from the molecular arrangement to mm -hmm. the properties that you measure. Yeah, yeah. They're, so they're the perfect tools. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, any other? Karen. Karen. We need a microphone. <laughs> and there's a... uh, thank you. Um, could you see these probes as having a role in studying membrane dynamics in, say, osmotic um, shock conditions in single-celled organisms? in bacteria, for instance, yeah. or is it potentially too complex a membrane system? So it will be more complex to interpret the results, and that's the, the reason why we are uh, trying to, to follow this approach. Uh, but indeed, uh, we already have uh, uh, done some, some experiments where we uh, use this, uh, these dyes to stain the, the, the membrane from, from E. coli, and you can, you can measure the, the effect uh, of uh, different stressors on, on the membrane of bacteria, and also from some other eukaryotic cell, uh, cells. So yeah, that's something that is quite uh, quite established. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and <coughs> we have a question here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. I, I I'm I'm not sure. Maybe I missed it. I, I'm wondering what's the um, kind of time resolution that you can achieve with uh, this imaging, and how does it you know, correspond to the actual uh, time scale of the molecular viscosity changes that you can expect mm -hmm. from living systems? So in terms of time resolution, it depends on the modality that you're uh, using. So there's uh, some families of uh, ratiometric molecular rotors. In that case, uh, you can do in the millisecond uh, range. Uh, if you are using the lifetime, then you are basically limited by the accumulation time that uh, you need in order to build uh, enough uh, photon count uh, to get a proper fit. As a rule of thumb, uh, you can go, if you are, you know, you, you are like in an optimized system, let's say, you can go like 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Ideally, a uh, half a minute is a, a good kind of time resolution that you can, that you can get. But these processes uh, usually take uh, around 10 minutes to kind of stabilize, so I think you can keep some, like it, it will not be like super high time resolution because again, like you, you are limited with this, but uh, you can you can measure the, the kinetics. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Do you have any other questions? Online? No. Okay, thank you. Then right. just join me. Uh, join me in thanking Miguel again, please. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And our, uh, I can keep this one. And our next speaker, 
uh, is Kyler Roy. He's a PhD student in the Department of Bioengineering in the RLA lab. Thank you for being here, Kyler. Thank you. So, over to you. Awesome. How's everyone doing? Good. Nice. <laughs> um, as I uh, mentioned, my name is Kyler Roy. Uh, I am a PhD candidate and in the Rodrigo's group in the RLA lab. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about my non-repetitive CRISPR AI toolkit for mostly in met for metabolic engineering purposes in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, do we have a lot of wet lab people in the building today? Yeah, show of hands, everyone. Sweet, that's like most of us here. Um, so I want to start off this presentation about everyone thinking about a really annoying task that's repetitive that you do day to day in the lab. It could be mini preps, glycerol stock labeling tubes, whatever you want. Um, I want you to think about why you hate doing this particular repetitive task. Um, and for me, it is qPCR. And the reason why I hate doing qPCR so much is because I routinely mess it up all the time. And so we'll have this nice qPCR plate over here. I'll be adding in reagents in well one, two, three, and eventually I'll get to somewhere like here. And I'm like, did I add the primer? <laughs> did I add the template? Um, what should I do next, you know? Um, should I assume that I added it and I potentially double the concentration? Should I assume that it did not add it and potentially miss it? Should I redo the whole plate and just waste all these reagents? Right, so show of hands if something like this has happened to you in the lab. Pretty much everyone. And if you did not raise your hands, you're either a robot or a liar because <laughs> It is literally in our DNA to make these repetitive mistakes. So even our favorite, one of our favorite enzymes, DNA polymerase, as it's going through repetitive streaks of DNA, um, it can either duplicate these regions, delete these regions, or um, you know, slow down and take its time to process it properly. So it's literally in our genetics to make mistakes in you know, repetitive tasks. And you're probably sitting, thinking to yourself, why do I care? Um, this isn't a therapy session for us all to, in the lab, why you make mistakes. Um, we care because uh, we're bioengineers. And so one of our favorite bioengineering uh, engineering tools is CRISPR. And CRISPR is an inherently um, repetitive. It's literally in the title, right? And while there are many CRISPR tools available that people use for engineering, today I'm mostly gonna talk to you about CRISPR activation and inhibition which consists of using a DCAS9 uh, fused with an activation domain or a repression domain, which could target the Cas proteins to a promoter of region which can activate or repress genes as necessary. And the beautiful thing is this entire process can be multiplexed. So by using one single transcript, you can express many guide RNAs simultaneously uh, to activate or repress uh, as many genes as you would like. Um, and by using orthogonal Cas nucleases, such as DCAS9 over here on the left and DCAS12 on the right, fused to an activation or repression domain, um, they recognize their own specific guide RNAs, which again, down below, have distinct structures. Um, and by recognizing these distinct guide RNAs, you can essentially activate or repress genes simultaneously with zero crosstalk within our system. And this is an amazing tool for metabolic engineering, which is essentially trying to reduce a particular metabolite of interest in greater quantities. Um, so I apologize for this disgusting metabolic network, but for example here, if you want to make succinic acid down below, you can simultaneously activate and repress many genes along this network to shift flux right from your feed to your metabolite, increasing your yield. Um, and while our system has some easier components to express, like the Cas and the nucleases up here, um, expressing the large polycystronic multiplex array has been much more challenging to do. And the reason why it has been much more challenging to do is due to its repetition. And to kind of explain that, I need to go through the anatomy of a multiplexed array. So starting on the left here, we have the guide RNA protospacer. So this is the base pair target that goes to, uh, that targets the Cas and the nucleases to the uh, site of the genome of interest. Next, you have the Cas9 uh, scaffold. So this is a uh, part of the guide RNA that allows the Cas enzyme to recognize it, grab onto it, hold onto it to get delivered to the genome. Next, you kind of have uh, a bacterial terminator or Cas9 terminator that kind of signals the end of the guide, so uh, adds stability uh, and ends transcription. 
um, followed by uh, a CSY4 recognition site. So CSY4 is um, kind of like a molecular scissors. It recognizes these little hairpins and able to cut at these sites to liberate all the individual guides along your array. And then finally, you have the CAS12 scaffold, which again, like the CAS9 scaffold, it's just recognition uh, sequence by the CAS uh, enzyme to grab onto that guide RNA. But the main thing I want to show on this slide is that these four circles here are all um, up here along the length of the guide RNA array, and they're all repetitive DNA. Right, to kind of simplify this a little bit more, you'll see you have your protospacer scaffold CS by four, and this light yellow um, and blue happens all the way throughout the multiplex array, and this can be to the end. It's all repetitive DNA in an occurrence system. This can be up to uh, 24 times. And because of all this repetition, uh, the commercial synthesis of this array um, is unavailable. It's hard to do. So that makes, um, so for example, uh, a couple years ago, we released this manuscript where we made a multiplex array to target uh, 24 genes. Um, and uh, to, as a proof of concept, we made this 11 guide array to activate um, these two genes in green and repress these uh, nine genes in red in central metabolism of Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, to increase the yield of succinic acid. So if you take this 11 guide array down here, and for example, if you want to punch it into IDT and order it as a gene block, you'll immediately get this error saying, no, it's impossible. It gives you a complexity score of 454. Um, and this is largely due to all the repeats in the sequence. So um, you just can't order it as a gene block. Uh, all these repetitive sequences make it hard to commercially synthesize. So that means you have to clone it the hard way. And so by PCR amplifying and Golden Gate cloning, uh, you can assemble these large arrays, but uh, it's incredibly inefficient. And nine times out of 10, I get plates that look like this. Absolutely zero colonies. And at first, I, I kind of struggled. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm really terrible at cloning. But it's just kind of the nature of the beast of when you add repetitive DNA, it's just low um, success rate. But then every once in a while, you do get some success. Uh, you do find a couple colonies on your plate, and then you pick them up, uh, you send it for sequencing, and you see this large error. And this isn't just the part being missed, it's some sort of recombination event. So months and months of just empty plates, terrible sequencing, it just made me really stressed out. My hairline kind of went up like at least like five centimeters during my entire PhD. And uh, it's been challenging. So you might be thinking to yourself now, but like when you do have this plasmid, it must be stable forever, right? And you're absolutely wrong. So if you were to take a 24 guide multiplex array, for example, and you seal the passage it over several generations and send it for sequencing after so many days, you'll notice that over time that you get more and more and more deletions and duplications. And to the point where after seven days, you almost see your entire array knocked out in E. coli. And this is uh, consistent with the literature. So there is this EFM calculator. So it essentially measures uh, the instability of plasmid DNA in E. coli based on repetitive motifs. And if you take this 11 guide array I mentioned earlier, you punch it into this calculator, it gives you an instability score of 29,000. So that means it's 29,000 more times likely to mutate per generation than the baseline um, E. coli. So now you might be thinking to yourself, but what if I just transform this plasmid into your host yeast um, really, really fast? You know, it has to be stable at that point, right? If you genome integrate it into Saccharomyces. And you're wrong. So to kind of test this, uh, I made a BFP reporter assay, essentially controlling BFP um, and targeting it with either a single guide, three guides, or six guides. So essentially zero guides, uh, zero repeats, three repeats, and six repeats to repress the expression of uh, the blue fluorescence protein. And so when you look at the flow cytometry data, where we have different passages here on the y-axis and the fluorescence intensity on the x-axis, you can see at day zero, you see a large amount of blue fluorescence. Then once you target it with the guide RNA, you see this nice leftward shift. And when you have a single guide or zero repeats, this uh, decrease in fluorescence is stable across all seven days. But when you add three guides or three different repeats, you'll notice that approximately on day four, you'll see the subpopulation emerge. And it's reverting, you see this rightward shift, and it's reverting back to its baseline. And then over time, this, this baseline population of BFP becomes the most dominant and the only population remaining. And more interestingly, when you have six guides targeting it, at day four, you see this escape. It's much, much, much more prominent than in the three, day, uh, in the three guides. 
And this shift is much more dramatic at day five as well, where it's the only population remaining. So just to kind of summarize, more guides equals more problems um, and more instability within the multiplexed array. And this is confirmed by colony PCR, where you can see uh, where I amplified the region flanking the multiplex array. And at day zero, you can see um, a nice little ladder here between one guide, three guides, and six guides, where at day seven, it's almost completely gone. Um, so you can see that it's not the CRISPR proteins or the BFP getting mutated or lost in the array. It is the array it's, uh, in the system. It's the array itself that is recombining and getting lost over time. Right, and this is obviously a massive problem for metabolic engineering. So again, if we have the system that makes succinic acid and all the flux shifting from feed to metabolite, and you slowly start losing your guides to alter this metabolism, you eventually start losing your, your yield, your titers, and eventually you go back to your baseline strain that is no better at producing your metabolite than the wild type. Right, so how I'm fixing this is that, again, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It has all this repetitive DNA. If you remove all this repetition um, and make it unique sequences, essentially you can become CRISP, where uh, you get rid of all this repeats. And to do this, I took all the four repetitive parts of our multiplex array. Um, I mutated the individual bases uh, while maintaining the secondary structure. And if you do this, the Cas enzymes can still recognize these distinct hairpins and use it as a functional guide. I then took all these, this mutant library um, and used a flow assay to kind of detect their ability to uh, decrease GFP fluorescence. And then took these individual uh, CRISPR elements, fused them together as one distinct self-processing CRISPR AI unit. And then I add them all together on one single plasmid to make the non-repetitive CRISPR toolkit. So you might be asking yourself, are the non-repetitive guides any better? Um, and earlier I showed that you can't commercially synthesize a, a repetitive multiplex array. But if you take um, my system and you utilize a and or try to order as a G block, it gives you an, uh, a complexity score of 1.9. So using non-repetitive guides, you can order the exact same multiplex array as a G block, so easier to clone. Um, earlier, I mentioned that the repetitive guide RNAs are insta uh, unstable in E. coli and have an instability score of 30,000 approximately. Um, using the non-repetitive guides, you get an instability score of 1.2, so just marginally more um, in unstable than the baseline E. coli. So are they better for metabolic engineering? And this is what I'm currently working on in the final phase of this project. Um, and to do this, I'm gonna make raspberry ketone. And so it is a nice fragrance uh, used in the perfume industry, um, as well as a nutraceutical for weight loss. And to kind of test this, I'm gonna design a 24 guide repetitive array and using the exact same guides, uh, but non-repetitive versions, uh, just measure raspberry ketone in a bioreactor over seven days and hopefully um, the non-repetitive arrays become more stable and increase the yield over this time period. Uh, so just that quick summary is uh, repetitive DNA is, is bad. You know, it's hard to work with. It's annoying, uh, low efficiency. It's unstable. Uh, if you can avoid using repetitive DNA, I highly recommend you do that. Um, and that non-repetitive guide RNAs, to be determined if they're better, but theoretically at this point, they, they seem to be a lot more easier system to work with. So obviously I'd like to acknowledge uh, everyone in the RLA lab as well as my supervisor Rodrigo for the opportunity to work in the lab and to learn, um, as well as the entire center for synthetic biology um, at Imperial, um, and obviously all the sources of funding that allowed this to happen. So uh, as of now, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask right now. And if you think of one later, don't hesitate to email me at kbr20 at ic.ac.uk. Um, hopefully I can get back to you shortly with that. And that ends my talk, if anyone has any questions. Giver. Thank you, Tyler. Really nice. Resonated at so many levels. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I do computation, so ex but repetitive tasks, even in computation, are a pain. And you know, eventually, your brain switches off. Um, amazing that you should. We have time for to, uh, for questions. Any questions? Yes, Cristala. Yeah. 
So first, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> it's, it's useful, I think, for people to hear what's really going on. Um, I have two questions, one of which you, you may have kind of answered because you said it's, it's yet to be seen if it's any better. Yeah. Um, and you have a specific application, but I'm wondering if uh, you've tested it even on, on you know, simple reporter proteins to see if making those changes have any impact on the degree of, of activation or repression that you see? Uh, so all the different versions of these guidelines do have different activating or repression levels. The, the ones I selected for the toolkit will have individually um, have you know, upwards of 90% effectiveness of the, of the wild type. Uh, I am currently doing the, the flow experiment again with the non-repetitive guides to see if it's more stable in that regard. I don't have the data for that at the moment though, but I'm currently working on that assay as well, that reporter. And so then my second question is, do you have a sense as to what the upper limit is, right? You referenced a previous published paper that had 12 arrays, um, yeah. difficult to produce. Um, any sense of, of how much, uh, how many you can, can make and what the, the upper limit is on that? Is it the ability to, to generate diversity so that you minimize repetition? Is it the size of the cassette? What are the factors that will determine how many of these you could do at once? I mean, all those things are obviously coming to, to play. Um, in our manuscript that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, we found that the guide RNAs actually express themselves even without a promoter. And if you go beyond 24, you start seeing a lot of leaky expression of the guides. So depending on what type of CRISPR application you're using, um, you can start creating a lot of burden. And so it, it was a lot of work on uh, this old postdoc, Will Shaw, that he made to really silence the array when you don't want it to be expressed. So um, the problem once they get bigger and bigger, at least in Saccharomyces, is that you'll have this leaky expression, and the more guides you have, the more burden you'll have. So it all de probably depends on the context of how you want to manipulate metabolism. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I, I'm sure you already tried this or something similar, but I'm still curious to know um, what is the improvement if you use some strain of E. coli or uh, Saccharomyces that is simply defective for recombination? So the uh, E. coli experiment that I showed there is actually in a RecA negative strain, so it's still recombinated or had recombination happening. Um, so uh, I'm currently working on trying to investigate the mechanism of the knockout of the array, and so there's many different ways this repetitive sequence can be removed from the cell. One is homologous recombination, another one is genetic slippage. So the slide I showed where DNA polymerase is stalling doing repetitive stretches, essentially what can happen is uh, it can make a, a hairpin loop and then stall and then delete that entire array. So it has nothing to do with recombination, it just has to do more with the, the, the replication machinery just emitting um, that repetitive stretch. So I'm trying to figure out exactly the mechanism behind it. So for E. coli, using a RecA negative strain, it doesn't, doesn't help. And in Saccharomyces, one of the beautiful things about the organism is the ability for homologous combination. And that allows you to engineer the strain for almost whatever purpose you want. Easy to work with. And so if you start knocking out this recombination ability, you make it much more harder to you know, engineer for your application. So um, there's probably some sort of trade-off between it. Um, maybe using an inducible CRISPR to knock out homologous combination after you engineered it. I don't know. There's some strategies around it I'm thinking about doing. but. Um, at least any coli RecA negative strains don't, don't seem to help, and engineering Saccharomyces to be RecA negative essentially um, might be detrimental for engineering. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the great talk. Um, do you know if like the wild type CRISPR has any like has the same instability, or does it have any mechanism to to keep it there? So when we engineer our CRISPR systems, we use a single guide RNA. So um, there's you know different guides in the native bacterial system that they'll fuse together as one. Um, in engineering, we fuse it together as one single transcript, essentially, um, which adds the, to repetition and makes it. Uh, more simple for engineering, but more repetitive in this regard. In native bacterial systems, though, um, it is a little bit more stable because you 
don't necessarily have the single engineered repetitive sequence, but they found over time that um, when you have this array, all the guides are added sequentially along the array, and that's kind of like a molecular recorder of past infections. And so they found that the arrays at the ends are a lot more stable than ones in the middle. Um, so again, this kind of leads to that it's more of a genetic slippage event causing the arrays to get kicked out over time. So they do see it's unstable, um, probably a little bit more stable than what I'm seeing in the lab, but um, because of its, you know, um, molecular advantage to have these guys that for defense, they probably act as an advantage to keep this array in there, and they find that more recent and more distant um, infections are a lot more stable than the ones in the middle of the array. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to ask, uh, how about the future direction of that project? I mean, uh, maybe like, trying to uh, try different kind of uh, Cas9s or the variant of Cas9 and then how about the fitness of uh, uh, the, the array and the, the Cas9s, yeah. Sorry, uh, I didn't quite. Yeah, 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 the future direction of your project. Uh, yeah. uh, you can, uh, can you try a different variant of Cas uh, proteins uh, for that kind of? I mean, that'd be an interesting way to do it because each cast ortholog has a slightly different gut RNA structure, but then you need to express many different cast enzymes, um, which are obviously burdensome to a cell. So um, if you want to have many guides, or many guides targeting the gene simultaneously, um, it's probably advantageous to reduce the amount of cellular burden and reduce the amount of cast orthologs in there. So, you, you, I mean, it could, it could be a strategy for sure using different orthologs, but then you're adding a lot of protein burden, um, and so I don't know if it'll necessarily be advantageous to do that. Mm. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, I'll give you the mic. Uh, great talk. I was just wondering, um, you use Cas12 as well as Cas9. Um, do you have any like trans cleavage issues with Cas12? Uh, so we use a dead cast okay. for both, so we don't see any cleavage activity. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just kind of following on that, does the trans cleavage activity I thought the transcleavage activity happens because of like a full change and then an um, opening of a kind of a nuclear site. So can you make that dead? At, like is the dead cast dead in both cis and transcleavage modes? I, I haven't noticed any. I, I believe that they're both nuclease, all that no, nuclease activity is dead in these. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. 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 I'll look at it. Yeah, thank you. It was a really cool talk. Um, with the RNA, with designing the, the new versions, I guess I'm just interested to hear how you did that. There's lots yeah. of literature coming out on machine learning ways to do it, and I guess there's other ways. Yeah. And yeah, uh, what actually works? Um, so there's a, a there's a couple other uh, groups that done very similar stuff in E. coli. So some of the guides I stole from these other papers um, basically um, they use some sort of machine learning or some sort of, uh, I'm not very much a computer guy, so I can't really do that. Um, but they, they had some sort of algorithm to design um, these different scaffolds, essentially mutating all the different bases while maintaining that secondary structure. How I designed my novel ones is that there's a software called NuPack. Um, and so they, some really smart computer people kind of made a really dumb user-friendly version of um, copying and pasting a nucleotide sequence, figuring out its binding um, affinities, their 3D structure, copying and pasting that structure into a platform, and then it can just generate all these different variants. And so I just copied and pasted that and, um, and designed it myself via that program, NuPack. Um, nice one, but uh, um, with the, you know, obviously machine learning having more and more pr like prominence, it would probably be a really cool way to design even more guides and less troubleshooting behind it because 
90% of the guides are tested and aren't functional. So um, if you're able to take some of these functional guides, feed it back into the model and kind of, you know, better, more rational designing of the future ones, save a lot of time. Excellent. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Kyler. Very nice talk. Thank you. And our next speaker is Professor Mark Howarth. Uh, he's the Shields Professor of Pharmacology in the, at the University of Cambridge, Department of Pharmacology as well. Waiting for the slides. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Mark, thank you for being here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to, to have the chance to um, speak here today. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, at the start, um, a lot of this work has actually been uh, car carried out in my lab previously in Oxford, now in Cambridge, by people who've been trained at, at Imperial. Um, and so everyone who's been involved in, in uh, the, uh, creating the excellent sort of teaching environment and uh, generating the, the uh, wonderful can-do attitude in molecular bioscience and synthetic biology, I want to really thank you at the start. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of our lab's work on uh, developing new kinds of protein interactions um, and exploring how that can empower basic research, um, develop potentially therapeutic tools, uh, all the way through to uh, the, the clinic and um, thinking about big challenges in infectious disease and, and global health. Um, and so we are often looking for inspiration um, and we've uh, seen earlier in the talks today wonderful inspiration um, looking in, in nature uh, and in the biosphere, but we can also get our inspiration from uh, what, what happens in laboratories, uh, synthetic organic chemists. Um, and so my lab's been very inspired by uh, click chemistry, which won the Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago. Um, and so that this is the work um, trying to get molecules to come together incredibly simply and robustly. Um, and uh, obviously there'd be many sort of synthetic reactions before, um, but the real focus here is, is on uh, simplicity, robustness, um, so a high uh, modularity. So you can take two reactive groups. These are sort of, this is sort of the prototype. Uh, you have an alkyne and azide, and you mix them together, they, they react. But the nice thing about uh, a, a sort of click chemistry reaction is you can have your alkyne attached to all sorts of different things, your azide attached to uh, all sorts of different things, and the reaction will still work. And that's not the case for, for lots of chemical processes. Um, so they also want very high yield. They want it to happen under all sorts of conditions, so you don't need to work in, in a glove box and have it completely dry, and then you can apply it in, in living systems. Uh, and also have, this is really important, um, starting from things that are easy to get hold of. Um, and I'll talk about that in, with regard to uh, biology. So, so what I want to introduce is this concept of click biology, um, where we'd like to have a few good reactions that can join biomolecules with some of these really advantageous characteristics. And if you think about click chemistry, um, the essence for... Uh, which turned into bioorthogonal click chemistry, having selectivity away from all the natural chemistry in living systems, is they put in these exotic functional groups, which you almost never find. Um, and so what I'm looking for for click biology is can we get robust reactions, but using the groups that every, every cell of every organism has got. So simple things, amines, carboxylic acids, hydroxyls, thiols, can we lock things together in, in an efficient and selective way? Um, and so these are the things that, that we want to achieve. Uh, we want to make it from regular biological building blocks, um, so actually not use our natural amino acids. Can we do this with the regular things that, that uh, cells have got? Um, have broad fusion tolerance, get really high yield, so things are, things are uh, very efficient. We want it to happen fast, because biology is moving you know, incredible speed, you, you blink your eye in, uh, in a fraction of a second. Um, there's a lot of biological events that have, have gone into that. Uh, we want a level of control that we don't have to wait hours for, for things to happen. We can uh, exert rapid control. Um, condition tolerance. So 
biology is complicated. We've got, we've got uh, organisms that survive in ice. We've got ones that survive in hot springs. Uh, we've got... Uh, you know, everyone focuses on pH 7, where you look in, in a eukaryotic cell, you've got the lysosome pH 4, you look in your digestive system, you've got the stomach pH 1 to 2, you've got uh, in your pancreatic secretions, it's up at pH 10. So we want things that work under uh, a range of situations, we've got oxidizing environments, we've got reducing environments, um, so it's nice to have reactions that are, that are highly tolerant. Uh, and then we don't just want it working in our one favorite organism. We want to e easily be modularizing it. So if for people working on bacteria, for people working in mammalian systems, for people working in plants, we want uh, a system which will be generally uh, applicable. So, so that was sort of the, the, the challenge. Where do we start? Um, so in, in this case, we start by, by looking to nature. We look at this uh, bacterium, Streptococcus pyogenes. So this is something that uh, probably almost certainly everyone in the room has been infected with this bacterium. Uh, it just causes um, a, a sore throat, strep throat most of the time. Um, occasionally causes more, more dangerous conditions. Um, but it faces a challenge. So it lives in the back of your throat and your nose uh, and it needs to establish these, these biofilms uh, and it needs to avoid getting uh, swept away as, you, as people sneeze and cough and the mucus is flowing. So it's got some clever anchoring mechanisms. Um, and so it's got these adhesion molecules which, which can grab on. Um, these, this protein called FBAB, it's got some very interesting chemistry. It forms a thioester at the end terminus, which is a sort of reactive warhead. But along the chain, it's got some other domains. And, and this is the one that we homed in on as being particularly exciting because it does this kind of protein chemistry that is really unusual. Um, so uh, normally you've got these side chains, lysine and aspartic acid, you find them on the surface of the proteins, they would be charged, and you just get a little bit of electrostatic interaction. But in this very specific environment that this has evolved in this protein domain, they will just spontaneously react. So it's a bit like GFP, the protein folds and the reaction happens. Um, and it's kind of paradoxical because normally if you want to form an amide bond, you've got to put some energy in, you activate it with ATP. Um, but here you get amide bond formation, you lose water even in uh, an aqueous environment. Um, so, uh, and what, what's happening, so it's in the hydrophobic core of the protein, there's a glutamic acid opposite, so it's a kind of triad uh, which, which helps facilitate the reaction and um, shuffle the hydrogen uh, the, the protons and facilitate amide bond formation. So um, what uh, Bijan, Jacob and Emily uh, in, in, in my lab set out to do was to turn this lock uh, into a glue. Um, and so all, the, all these proteins are named uh, spy from S. pyogenes. So we thought, how do we harness this chemistry? The simplest thing we can do is just split this protein into, into parts. Uh, so, so we take out one bit, which is the spy tag, um, which is a peptide, and then we have the rest of the protein, which is the spy catcher. Uh, so the spy tag, it's a short peptide, it's got this aspartic acid. The rest of the protein is the spy catcher, it's got the lysine. Um, and so the vision was, you fit these two together, everything is perfectly aligned, and hopefully you can get this, this reaction to happen. Um, and so the spy tag will fit in the groove of, of the spy catcher, uh, uh, and that seemed like the simplest way to uh, uh, advance the chemistry. So, so uh, sort of echoing back to um, the, the click biology criteria that I was talking about, uh, what Bijan in my lab could establish is that we, we mix these two together and we get very high yield, so we can get up to 99% conversion. Um, there's almost no side products to happen because we're starting with things that are pretty unreactive. It's just an amine carboxylic acid, you know, what side reaction could happen. Um, uh, but also, we've got this robustness to conditions. So we can do this under all sorts of different uh, pH, temperature, no particular uh, requirement for anions or cations in contrast to most uh, enzymes. Uh, and also, in this sort of test tube situation quite fast, um, but this is when we put proteins together at 10 micromolars, so what would be typical after you purified them. Um, but uh, thinking about the challenge in biology, most of the things you're interested in are not at 10 micromolar. A typical protein expressed in a cell it might be a low nanomolar range. So how does the reaction happen then? Well, if you start with the parent system, uh, the original spy tag spy catcher, 
Um, this has got a second order rate constant of two times 10 to the three. And so if both partners are at low concentrations, 40 minutes in and you've only got a little bit of coupling. Um, and as I said, you want to follow, you know, cells are doing things, well, that's not fast enough. So, so Anthony Keeble in my lab set about uh, using uh, directed evolution on both the, the tag and the catcher, combined with some, some computational stabilization um, and, and uh, facilitating nice complementary interactions. And we got a second generation, the 002 pair, which is about 10 times faster. We got a third generation, spy tag 003, spy catcher 003. Uh, and so this is now a lot faster. Um, this is actually close to the diffusion limit for molecules of this size. So at that point, we thought, okay, well, you know, that's, that's doing pretty well. And so the consequence now is we've got both partners at low concentrations, and just in 10 minutes, we can get the majority of, of this to couple. So we can get this sort of reaction at a, a, a speed that fits in with, with most cellular expression levels and most cellular uh, events. Um, and so we can, we can apply this uh, uh, approach and we can generalize it and we can look elsewhere in nature, where else do you find this chemistry? So it's not just in um, strep pyogenes, it's also in strep pneumoniae, another gram-positive bacterium. Um, and so we can take a domain of this, slightly different chemistry, so it's a lysine asparagine. So in this case, we have ammonia as a product, but we can uh, apply it in a similar way. We can take out one peptide, uh, and we have a snoop tag, snoop catcher pair, or we can take out, take out another peptide. The thing you notice about dog tag, it's actually a hairpin, it's not a linear strand. So that's very useful for putting it into tight turns uh, in proteins. Um, we can also uh, direct it for um, uh, peptide peptide ligation, that's the, the snoop ligase system. Um, so we have these orthogonal pairs, they're not quite as fast. Um, dog tag, dog catch is about as fast as the original uh, spy tag, spy catcher. Um, so uh, with, with this uh, general approach, uh, we started doing this, other labs started uh, employing the, the strategy, and there's now this big set uh, of, of similar pairs. Uh, GSK decided they, want, they wanted their, their own pair that, that they engineered. So it seems like a generally applicable way to get irreversible interactions to peptides. So we've got a nice module. We can stick things together uh, irreversibly through an amide bond, uh, efficiently, what can we do with this? Uh, took us a while to come up with the, um, some killer applications, um, but uh, we've been using it to stabilize enzymes. So we put spy tag at one end, spy catch at the other. You lock the termini, which are often the floppiest bits of enzymes, and those enzymes, um, which initially you heat them, or you give them harsh conditions, they unfold. Um, when you cool them, they tend not to refold, they tend not to, to aggregate and not regain activity. We've shown for many enzymes, which we call spy rings, um, that in this case, having cyclized them, they can regain full activity after those harsh conditions. It really helps their, their refolding. Um, we can interface with, with nanotechnology, with all sorts of uh, cool platforms, gold nanoparticles, magnetic beads, bubbles, um, great work done in Imperial uh, link, using this to anchor to, to graphene for, for cryo -EM. Um, uh, Also connecting to uh, gene therapy vectors. I'm going to come on to other nanoparticles later. Uh, thinking about mechanical biology, so this is uh, the, the isopeptide bond that you form is stable to uh, uh, heat and high temperature, but it's also stable to force. Um, so for people understanding how uh, force uh, changes molecular behavior, you need something rigid to anchor onto, um, and spy tag spy catch has often been, been that key link. Uh, and then in the biomaterial space, again, you've got uh, substantial forces that you want to resist, but you want to do it in a, in a programmable way. Um, so this is, this is nice work um, from uh, Francis Arnold, Tim Liu, um, taking uh, genetically encoding molecules with multiple spy catchers, another one with multiple spy tags. Nothing happens to them, they're, they're nice and soluble as is, but you mix them, and if you want to in seconds, you can get them to gel, uh, but it's completely programmable. So you can put in cleavage sites, you can put in uh, interaction sites to uh, integrins, uh, you can put in growth factors, uh, and, and then because it's specific, it's very cell-friendly cell to, to do this assembly. 
Um, so uh, thinking about sort of moving towards uh, applications re relevant to the immune system, which is a big focus in our lab, um, uh, uh, in terms of antibody technology, massively powerful for studying fundamental biology, um, a lot of us are operating at the level of, you know, two or three antibodies to study our favorite pathway. Um, but the way the world is moving, we need to, to head to a situation where we've got uh, at least one antibody to everything in the proteome of your favorite organism. And then, you know, one person's favorite organism may be E. coli, another may be uh, a plant or, or a Drosophila or a naked mole rat. So actually the world is going to need uh, tens of thousands of uh, effective antibodies. And when you have those antibodies, you're going to want to use them uh, in, in all sorts of different assays. So you might do flow cytometry, you might uh, be doing lysers and you need it linked to an enzyme, you might want to inject in an organism and you need a circuit, certain circulation time or a certain reporter. So we also want very efficient functionalization of those molecules. And if we're going to do that genetically, say 50,000 antibodies, 10 fusions, half a million constructs to uh, purify uh, and characterize, that really doesn't scale very well. So much better if we can use a modular approach to link on the effector domains. Um, so this is nice work uh, uh, initially developed by, by Jim Collins applying spy tag, and, and I'm going to tell you how we've taken this forwards. Um, so having a binder with the spy tag, you make it once, and then you can link it to all sorts of modules link, linked to spy catcher, fluorescent proteins, enzymes, toxins, uh, and so on. Um, so the way that we've taken this forward is uh, not just linking a binder to an effector, but linking a binder to another binder, because a lot of biology depends upon bringing molecules together, um, and that's done effectively by, by bispecific antibodies. Um, and the, these have had great success in the clinic. You think of bites um, that, are, that are targeting the immune system to kill cancer. Um, but I think there's an awful lot to discover about uh, how, how molecules communicate um, and, and, and find new synergy. Uh, and extraordinary subtleties in, in how um, uh, cells sense information. So there are many receptors where, as you pull them together, according to the, the changes in distance or the changes in angle, you get completely different things happening downstream in terms of how the cytosolic molecules sense proximity, sense orientation, and, and lead to different effects. So... People have been very interested in this approach, but they're trying to work out, okay, how do we start to build these molecules in, in high throughput? Um, and, and what has, has reached the clinic is using uh, uh, controlled uh, exchange, breaking disulfide bonds, reforming disulfide bonds. Um, and that's been, been quite powerful, but it really re requires uh, optimization every time you do it. So I'm going to tell you about the work of, of Claudia Driscoll, um, a, a graduate student in the lab, um, and she wanted to accelerate this process. Uh, and so this is what we call the spy mask approach. Um, and so the vision is that what we're going to do is we're going to get uh, many, many proteins linked to spy tag, um, so both antibodies, nanobodies, afibodies, even natural ligands like growth factors or, or signaling peptides. Um, and then... Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put them into a double spy catcher, a double catcher, so we've got a spy catcher, a spacer, a spy catcher. Of course, if you've got two ones and you, and you just add those, uh, you're going to get a statistical mixture. We don't want that to happen. We want to get a precise system. So this is what Claudia set up. So we've got our first spy catcher, we've got the linker, and then the second spy catcher's got a mask on. So the mask is just a dummy spy tag that has a mutation at the aspartic acid, so it can't react, and it sits in the groove, and that spy catcher is 99% cage from reaction. Uh, and then we've got a TEV site on a little loop, so um, uh, what we do is we add the first ligand, it goes in uh, site one, uh, and then we add our TEV protease, the little dummy peptide falls off, and then we can precisely get the second ligand in site two. Um, and Claudia could get that at 95% purity just to, in, a, in a warm pot reaction. So um, to, to give you an illustration of, of the kind of assemblies we can, we can make, um, uh, if, we, if we look at HER2, so this is a tyrosine kinase, uh, overexpressed on many cancers. It's a target of a, a successful breast cancer therapy, which is Herceptin. So this is uh, the, the fab from Herceptin. It's binding right here. But HER2 is a very nice nicely studied system, there's binders identified to all, all parts of the surface. 
So there's different fabs. Here's an, here's a nanobody. Here's an AFI body. Um, and so what Claudia did was just express each of these modules with a spy tag, use the spy mask system to plug them together in 96-well format, um, and then you add them to cells that have got HER2, the cancer cell line that uh, depends on HER2 for, it, for its survival, and you see what happens to those cells. So very simple uh, readout. Um, and what you see is everything happens. It's very complicated. Um, so red means the cells start dying. Blue means the opposite. The cells actually get stimulated to proliferate ev even more. Um, and so I think this sort of illustrates the, the complexity of uh, the, the, the different orientation, how you're recruiting these molecules, um, but also the need to, to explore at high throughput um, to enable us to find, to find more synergy uh, and really optimize um, the, the, the effects that we can have on the cells we want to, want to control. And so the second part of, of this platform is thinking the limitation of IgG. So IgG, fantastic therapeutics, but if you want to achieve precision in how you grab onto molecules, where well, you've got your FC, and then you've got fabs, and you've got flexible spaces. So these fabs are waving around, and they're not really sending the molecules exactly, their targets exactly where you want them. So what uh, Claudia could do is, by making a, a set of different double catchers, uh, we can actually tune where those fabs extend, and therefore where the molecules that they're linking to uh, are, are oriented. So, this uh, represents the, the uh, orientation of uh, the, the, the uh, spy tag and, and therefore how the, uh, the, the ligand would extend. So we've got uh, these, uh, this is sort of an initial set. We definitely want to, to extend this. Um, but you've got a lot of complexity. You've got three dimensions of distance. And then for each of these, you've got a rotation. Um, and so what you can see here is, again, blue means proliferating. So if we link. Uh, trastuzumab to an AFI body, we make this bispecific. Um, in this orientation, cells start proliferating. We change the orientation, and cells start dying. So we've got really very large uh, binder space um, that, that this approach can, can help us to explore and, and optimize. OK, so um, moving further and thinking about uh, immunology, I want to uh, now start thinking about um, the, the uh, uh, stimulating protective immune responses and vaccines. Um, so uh, m my initial background was in immunology, then I went into chemical biology and, and, and nanotechnology. Um, and from that perspective, I think vaccines fit very nicely because um, uh, it, the, your nano orientation really matters to how the immune system um, uh, considers a target. So if you take something completely foreign, um, and you inject it into a, a, an animal or a human, then the majority of the time you get little or no immune response. Um, and, and that's not by chance. That makes sense because your body you know, uh, is exposed to lots of things in your food. You breathe in, and you don't want to make immune responses to all of them because that would give you pretty bad uh, allergies or to immune diseases. Um, but if you can take something foreign and give it a nanosized orientation, so sort of... Uh, 20 to 100 nanometers. Um, if you have uh, a high-level multivalency on the surface of that, then the, the situation is very different, and your immune system uh, takes it very seriously, and you're likely to get a, a, a strong immune response. Um, so why does that happen? With that size, you head to the lymph node, which is the key place to, to kick off immune responses. Is someone with a swollen lymph node. When that particle interacts with a B cell, which is going to be key to make the antibodies, which are the, usually the most important things in, for successful vaccines, you get high-level clustering. Uh, you may get activation of, of uh, innate immune responses. Um, and so, actually, you know, from, from a nanotech point of view, making a vaccine is, is uh, somewhat straightforward. So, of course, there are many different ways that you can build vaccines, and, and people are now very familiar with um, these different viral vectors or, or mRNA platforms. Um, uh, in, in my lab, we've been very focused on, on virus-like particles because we think they have a very high safety margin. They can be very potent at eliciting antibodies, and they're also very scalable. Um, that you can make billions of doses of these very, very cheaply for um, you know, a few pennies a dose, um, and they can be very stable. 
So essentially, we have a protein-based virus like particle platform, uh, no nucleic acid in, it's not going to evolve. We have an antigen, we want antibodies to it. And if we can decorate it like this, then we probably may have a good vaccine. So that's the, the concept, very simple. Um, uh, and, and then the challenge has been that many of these antigens are not very nice proteins. They're marginally stable. They've got complicated uh, modifications. And so you do your genetic fusion, uh, and things uh, turn very stressful and, and keep failing. Um, and so your, your uh, particle may not assemble. Your particle may not have the native conformation. You may not be able to get it in, in high enough yield. Um, and it's really a very, very painstaking, slow process, and it's not really what we want in, in engineering biology. Then we talk to the chemists, and they come up with some cool coupling technologies, um, but then you tell them you know, how cheap it's got to be, and they, they, uh, everyone uses a very simple technology, which is cross-linking agents that would link an amine to, to a thiol. Uh, and so you get somewhat heterogeneous particles, and there's, you can publish lots and lots of papers on these, but these are not getting approved. These are, these are not good enough, really, to fool the immune response um, to uh, give you uh, the, the, the potent antibodies in a reproducible way. Um, so this is where uh, Linda and, and Carl, Carl's a former Imperial student, uh, came in. Um, and thinking about what we call plug and display vaccination, taking this modular strategy, uh, building the virus-like particle once, uh, with spy capture and, and uh, took, took some engineering to do this. Uh, this is starting from a phage protein. We later moved on um, adapting some of Neil King's and David Baker's computationally designed nanocages and then further developing uh, engineering them, them ourselves for high resilience. But essentially, we can make very large amounts, very cheaply, uh, of, of a spy capture virus like particle. And then, uh, generically, if you've got your targets um, from, from, from different pathogens, as long as you can make that antigen with a spy tag, then it's just a, a case of mixing it in. You will get your spy tag spy catch isopeptide von formation. You can get a high yield under all sorts of conditions and have something ready to, to kick off an immune response. Um, and so we started doing this on, on malaria, collaborating with Simon Draper and Shimi Biswas. Um, in, in uh, Oxford uh, Jenner Institute. Um, and since then, uh, other labs have, have really picked up on this and, and shown that this modular strategy can work for them in, in a big range of, of different viruses, can work in different bacterial proteins. You can even get it to work on self-targets. So um, because virus-like particles are so uh, stimulatory, you can break tolerance, you can take self-proteins, put them on and drive immune responses. Why do you want to do this? Well, uh, in cancer, um, you, want, you may want to have uh, a binders to checkpoint molecules, these overexpressed antigens, or even personalized medicine, things that are unique to a, an individual's cancer, you may be able to drive uh, immune responses, both antibody and T-cell based. Um, and so it's great that, that that's been picked up on, but we want to go beyond publishing papers um, and so now this has is, this is entered the clinic. So Simon Draper uh, has started a phase one, two trial. Uh, he's, he's working on uh, a blood stage uh, antigen for, for uh, ma malaria vaccination. Cytomegalovirus um, is a very common disease, um, uh, but there's, n there's no uh, good vaccine. It's the most common cause of, of deafness and blindness in, in babies. Um, and so a company I was involved in, in founding, Spy Biotech, this is now in phase one, so we're really keen to, to, to see how, um, how that will advance. Uh, and then uh, ADAPVAC have, have uh, uh, taken a SARS-CoV-2 into phase three. So this tag catch is slightly different tag catch technology, but it's already been tested in, in 4,000 people. So, um, so that's sort of the, the, the known viruses. I want to talk a little bit about this guy, a horseshoe bat, uh, which has got lots of uh, 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 viruses that you can sequence. Um, and uh, they're not yet a problem for humans, but you can see that there are not many mutations from being a problem, um, and we need to think about how we can actually do even better than the community did for, for the first uh, uh, COVID vaccine generation. So, um, you know, why do I say there is going to be a next pandemic? Um, well, I don't know if there will be a pandemic, but there will be new viruses emerging in, into humans. We've had SARS in this coronavirus family, we've had SARS-2, we've had MERS uh, carried by camels, 
Um, and you look in the, the bat sequences, um, also an interesting work done in UK bats. You can also find uh, viruses that, 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 that have some relevance here. Pangolins, uh, this Pang17, uh, have, have a virus in, in this family. Um, so we've, we've got this challenge. There's a lot of viruses out there um, with, with potential for, for transmission. So we started collaborating with uh, Pamela Bjorkman and Alex Cohen at Caltech. Um, uh, and the question Alex asked was, OK, if people have had COVID infection, we've got these, these viruses are a bit related. Uh, do, those anti, do those antibodies actually stretch out and, and give you protection across these other viruses? So the y-axis here is how, how much antibodies you've, you've got. So if you've had COVID, you've got antibodies to this receptor binding domain, uh, the key bit that grabs on to, onto the cell receptor. So everyone's got antibodies to that. But you look to a very close bat virus, so there's the RAT G, uh, RATG13, and you've got almost no antibodies to that, and very little, uh, but it's pretty much close to background for these related viruses. So, so people probably are not very well protected uh, should another virus emerge with, within this family. Um, so what Alex thought was, well, can we build a vaccine which would give that broad protection? Um, so he took this, the spycatch MI3. MI3 is our preferred uh, nanoparticle. It's full of holes. Um, and so uh, this is what, what people have done before, just link on the SARS-2 RBD with a spy tag. But what Alex did was just make uh, many of these viral uh, RBDs with the spy tag. You don't need to get hold of the virus. You just need some sequence. Um, and you, all you've got to do is mix them, and you get this, what we call a mosaic virus-like particle, um, and you can plug in four or eight uh, as, uh, as you prefer. And what's the idea? So the principle is we're trying to sort of do some sort of logic gating uh, uh, at the surface of, of these B cells. So if we hit the B cells with a uniform um, virus-like particle, they only need to stick on one bit of, of the surface, the B cell receptors get cross-linked, which is the key to activate them, and that B cell will be stimulated to divide, will make lots of antibodies. But those antibodies may just see one of the targets. Uh, in this case, the, the different colors represent different, different RBDs. Uh, only if, if the uh, B cell receptor sees features that are common between the different colors are you going to get strong stimulation, strong activation. So we're prov providing some kind of evolutionary pressure for the B cells that have that, that uh, cross-reactivity. So um, to give you just one little flavor of, of the, the, the data that we see from this, uh, what we do here is we make a pseudovirus, so a virus that's, that's not dangerous, but we can monitor its uh, cell entry ability, bearing this um, uh, uh, bat RBD, this virus is called SHC014, we, uh, we immunize mice and see how good those antibodies are at, at protecting from infection. So if we take the SARS-2 RBD alone uh, after immunizing mice, that's no good. That's not above background. We take that protein, put it on virus-like particle, well, that definitely helps. We get some protection. If we are not sure what virus is coming, uh, we, and we're a bit worried about this one, so we have it in a mixture of four, um, then with that mixture, we still get excellent antibodies to the SHC014. But I think this is the most interesting one. This is, doesn't have the SHC014, but it's got some relatives. So this is thinking about a situation where we don't know what viruses are emerging, but we know some of the family tree. We know some of the relatives, so potentially we can start to think about building these vaccine platforms before uh, a new danger emerges. And with this mixture, we actually get very good, uh, pretty substantial neutralizing antibodies um, from um, that sort of preemptive uh, vaccine. So, so this approach um, has, has got funded by this Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Um, and this is, this is moving very soon in, into clinical trials. Um, so we're very excited that this is a pretty unusual thing um, to, uh, to, to, to take into the clinic. Um, it's uh, unusually complicated. So we've actually got nine different components to get the best protection. We've got our spy catcher, MI3 uh, uh, cage, and then we've got these eight different viral proteins. Um, and so, uh, you know, very interested to see how that will develop, but thinking, can we do better for, for, for the long term? So I um, uh, want to tell you about the work of Rory Hills, also, also a graduate student in the lab. Um, 
And so he's been making these um, uh, tandem versions where we can actually take uh, multiple uh, RBDs and actually use genetic fusion. This is a, a quite a tolerant domain. Um, and uh, just giving you a, 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 a flavor of it. Um, so if we look at antibodies to the, the SARS-1, the original SARS, which was not in our assembly, um, using comparing uh, homotypic, so just putting one RBD on, or these mixtures, so this is pretty much the one that's going into clinical testing, we can actually, um, with this um, uh, quartet nanocage, we're calling it, uh, actually get even better uh, antibodies uh, elicited. So um, overall, I've tried to uh, introduce this concept of click biology, uh, having very uh, simple, fast, selective reactions to, to help uh, uh, synthetic biology move fast, people um, uh, do things that they can't do with classical methods. I've told you about Spitex bycatch. Of course, there's other reactions that are fantastic, split in teens, halo tag, snap tag that you may have used that I think meet some of, this, uh, some of these criteria. And I think it's important to reflect on what are the key characteristics for, for us to move forward as a community uh, in, in advancing these technologies, making them powerful, uh, for, for, for people. Um, but with the spy tag, we've tried to make a tool that would be very useful to people in, in all sorts of applications. I focused on irreversible locking, but biology, biological systems, you know, often dynamic assemblies are, are useful. And so we've also built pairs for spy tag spy catch that are, that are reversible and have tuned affinity. Um, and, and that's been employed in, in the cytosol. Um, we've shown that we can make a switchable spy catcher, and you can use that for purifying your protein, so you don't need to use a his tag, you can purify off, off uh, spy tag. We've used light control. Um, uh, we've uh, built a, a toolbox of uh, assemblies to give you controlled oligomerization. Um, and then we've also working on this networking to, to uh, using spy mask to very rapidly explore uh, binder space. Um, and in terms of you know, uh, uh, medical applications, um, we've uh, exploited this and, and made this broadly available for people to uh, build these tools to both to existing major challenges and, and maybe uh, newly emerging ones. Um, and it also sort of suggests a different approach to, to vaccine design. We have all these tools from genomics now, very rapid surveying of um, uh, uh, sequence space um, and I think some of this work shows that the, the real possibility of, of starting to, to build these vaccine platforms to certain families um, and really being, being pre-armed. So I'll, I'll stop there. Very grateful to all the members of my lab. Um, uh, as I said, many of whom were, were trained in Imperial uh, for their key contributions. Um, really grateful to Alan Townsend, Simon Draper, Shimi Biswas for the help um, on, on the vaccine development and, and Alex and, and Pamela Bjorkman. Um, and a uh, little shout out for Symbio UK. Hope to see many of you there. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Great talk. Questions? Uh, interesting talk, but one thing I want to ask, because it's never seems to do with the vaccines, is there was quite a bit of hostility to vaccines during COVID, and one of the reasons was needle phobia. Are they actually going to develop a vaccine on these lines, which can actually be orally administered like a, a sugar lump like they did for polio, because that might overcome some vaccine hesitancy? Yes. Um... I mean, that's a, that's a big question. It's been an, an area of massive interest. People have been thinking about it for a long time, trying all sorts of things. The challenge has been that, as, as I talked about before, um, the uh, immune system is not responding to, to everything. And so um, if you're breathing things in, you're eating them, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, focus is actually to, to uh, achieve tolerance to those. Um, and so when people have made uh, vaccines that are not delivered um, through injection, um, they've uh, either 
not stimulated strong enough and not got a, a reliable, you know, 95, 99% protection, um, or they've had to use different platforms, which, um, and, and this is really what's gone through, is um, uh, attenuated viruses, um, which are, uh, uh, have, have other, other challenges. So, um, so it's, it's something we'd all, we'd all like, but um, it, there's some sort of serious immunological challenges to that. Can I just make a quick response to that? Yeah. Um, if, say, the immune response is only 50% rather than 90% with the oral administration, surely that's better to develop it for people who don't like needles than it is simply not to, for, to soon have the jab and then people refuse it and they have zero protection if they don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's important sort of um, issues there of, of whether you have a, a sort of, um, uh, you know, choice and like a buffet system and when you're, when you're getting your vaccination or, you know, the government decides, okay, this is the most effective system, um, can, can we employ it? But, um, yeah, it'd be great to, to chat later and, and uh, get further perspective. Thank you. It's very interesting that it's very versatile. Uh, you have shown us a lot of examples. So I'm sorry if I missed it. I wanted to ask about the conjugation part. So uh, how and how complex is the conjugation of this catcher and tag to each of the components that you're going to uh, couple later on? Yeah, so, um, so it's all through, through genetic fusion. Um, and because the reaction's happening through the side chains, then uh, you can put it at the N-terminus or at the C-terminus, either, either part, and, and, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we've been exploring in some cases, you, you can also insert it at, at internal sites in proteins if, if that's most uh, effective. So we've tried to build in, yeah, that simplicity of um, simple genetic fusion to arm the parts, and then you just mix them together. It's done in the DNA level? At the DNA level, yeah, oh, exactly. So is there any consideration on... Uh, uh, so there, there might be possibility of change of structure, right? Because I'm not sure I could see that the catcher, for example, it's, uh, yeah. the size is not really big, but it's also rather big. Uh, is there any consideration on that possibility of the change of structure? So, I mean, m m most of the time, um, we, so we've now tested it on, um, in, in collaboration on a, a large fraction of the yeast proteome. Um, and... Uh, th 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 so I think we got to like 85% uh, through through those. So I think it, it's not working 100% of the time, um, but by and large, most proteins are, are pretty tolerant to to that fusion. Um, occasionally, we just change the size of the linker or swap it to the other terminus, um, but generally, high high ro robustness we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you see any trade-off between the performance of the vaccines as you start to generalize them more? Like, do you feel, do you, as they get more general, do they become less Oh, yes, good right. Um, I mean, we're very worried about that, but it's not really what we saw, actually. Having, having the mixture in, you get almost as much antibodies to, to the target. Um, the trade-off um, comes a little bit when you, when you focus in at the molecular level, and you start to think about where, where on your particular target you want the most of your antibodies. And what you find is the, the bits that are most protective, um, which is exactly where the receptor's binding, are the most variable that has been the most uh, evolutionary pressure. And then the bits that are most conserved um, often are not, not fully protective. So that's something that we're currently working on trying to uh, optimize that, that trade-off, but it's a great point. Yeah, thanks. Hi, great talk. Um, can you use these structures, these mosaic structures, in the context of creating a multivalent uh, vaccine? For, for instance, dengue, where you have the four serotypes causing the disease. So how do you control the expression and avoid the AD effect? <laughs> Okay, well, I, don't, I don't think I put dengue on my list. So dengue is, is really hard uh, target. Um, uh, it's also 
a, a bit different because it has a protein shell um, and which is naturally multimerizing, so it doesn't lend itself that easily to putting on another uh, uh, self-assembly. Um, uh, and uh, as you say, you've got this uh, ADE. So um, uh, I think for, th for things that are self-assembling, I think this is not maybe not the, the, the best approach. We have some, we're doing some other work, as, as I was just mentioning in response to the previous question about focusing immune responses that are separate to spy tag molecular assembly. Um, so I think that kind of molecular engineering is the next step for, for dengue. Hi, Mark. Um, oh, yeah. I think, if I'm not right, original version of CRISPR also comes from S. pyrogenes. Is that right? That's true. And, and I think yeah. there is some evidence or concern that a lot of humans already have antibodies against some of the components yep. against CRISPR. Do, have yep. you ever seen any issues with that, people having antibodies against spy tag, spy catcher? So, so our focus has been to use it not as a therapeutic but as a, as a vaccine. If you're working with a vaccine and you're building on something, you want that thing not to be human um, to avoid any danger of, of or, or autoimmunity. Um, so for, for pushing the, the, the vaccine applications, um, then I think that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, and we've, we've also done experiments to show that if you have those antibodies or you've made more of them, it, it has no effect on how much antibody you get to your new target. Um, but you raise a great point because with this molecular assembly, we're very interested in therapeutic options um, through these, through, through these bispecifics. Um, and so what we're, what we're exploring now is um, using some of these computational tools um, to actually turn, turn this bacterial protein and, and try and uh, camouflage it and, and hide it from the immune system, both at the surface level and because it could get processed by T cells, uh, remove these, these good targets. So that's, that's the next big advance. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, really enjoyable talk. Thank you. You mentioned just at the end uh, developing reversible reactions. So my question is around, do they come from the original spy tag, spy catcher system? And under what conditions is the, is the reaction reversible? Sorry, so, so just to clarify, um, uh, we, we stop the reaction happening and we get a non-covalent interaction, but then we drive reversal. Um, and so the way we've done this is uh, we, we focused on making a pH switchable one. Um, and so what we did was we put in a load of histidines very close to the um, spy tag on the spy catcher. Um, and there's two positive charges there. And so at neutral pH, everything fits and it's all fine and hydrogen bonding. And then you go to pH 5 and suddenly you've all these positive charges and we get very nice uh, release. So that, that's our preferred way in the spy switch to a loot. Um, but we all, what we found at that point is we also had built-in temperature switchability. So at, at 4 degrees at pH 7, uh, it, it interacts quite nicely. We keep at pH 7, but we go to 37, and it dissociates very nicely as well. So that's the sort of orthogonal way that can be convenient. Thank you. Thanks. Very interesting. And um, I'm wondering if there is a version of the system which is uh, essentially can self-ligate some short peptides. Is there a way to ligate short peptides, kind of to make like it circular? Cyclize. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, ooh, I guess we could do that. Um, you, you probably you may well be familiar with the split intine system that's fantastic at doing that, um, that you can do very, uh, very short peptides and get these uh, wonderful molecules you can genetically encode. And um, uh, Ali Tavasolis has, has, has massively advanced that. So um, that's not been our focus, but um, I just want to highlight that. Yeah, other very interesting chemistry around. Thanks. Thank you. If you have no further questions, no, then please join me in thanking Mark for an excellent talk and discussion. Okay, and with this, please join us for lunch outside and we'll continue with talks and the sessions uh, just before two.
OK, everyone, welcome back uh, to this second session of the, this symposium of the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering. Uh, my name is uh, João Cabral. I'm a professor of uh, soft matter engineering here in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And uh, I'll be, I'm also one of the associate directors of uh, IMSI. And so it's my pleasure to share, to chair this section, this session rather, and uh, invite our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Chinzia Clem. I was uh, just practiced earlier on. And uh, so we, f to start with, we'll have uh, two contributed talks. These will be relatively short talks. And then we'll have an invited talk, which is slightly longer at the end. Um, I will ask you, if you don't mind, to uh, refrain from asking questions during the presentations, of course, but keep them to the end. And whenever you ask the presentations, please introduce yourselves as, uh, as you start, just so that we can uh, put everything in context. There will also be people who are joining us online, and so they will be submitting questions too, so please keep them coming, and I will be managing those questions and sort of place them orally on your behalf. So if I could uh, invite Chinzi to take the stage and uh, um, ask her to start on, on telling us about understanding and optimizing phenotypic heterogeneity in S. Cherbice. Over to you, Chinzi. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, letting me present my work today. Um, one second. Um, yes, so my uh, presentation will be about understanding and optimizing phenotypic heterogeneity in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and I am um, a postdoc in the Rodrigo Ledesma Maro lab. Um, sorry. Um, and our lab is focused ge in generally on. Um, driving a more sustainable bioeconomy, um, using microbial organisms and engineering microbes to um, yeah, um, generate sustainable solutions that are not only better and more sustainable, but also cheaper, um, or at least competitive in pricing with um, uh, traditional uh, methods um, of uh, synthesis. And we're led by Rodrigo de Lesma Amaro, and um, yeah, our group is um, constantly growing in the past years. And the RLA lab has been um, working to produce uh, all these different compounds um, uh, in recent years and also worked on um, engineering yeast to uh, utilize cheaper feedstocks. And we have multiple different pillars in um, the RLA lab um, to optimize, sorry, um, I don't know why this happens, um, to optimize um, our, re uh, our research and to, to drive our research. And one of them is to um, um, engineer synthetic biology tools to um, optimize engineering. Then we work on uh, engineering bioproduction to generate yeast that can produce um, specific molecules that we're interested, interested in. Um, we work on microbial communities um, to understand how communities work and how communities um, can be used for uh, microbial bioproduction, engineering, and um, also, for example, to, to use these for division of labor and um, Specifically in my uh, project, I'm working on phenotypic heterogeneity and basically understanding um, why cells are um, behaving the way they do. And um, now, yeah, it already jumped ahead to my next slide. Um, what is phenotypic heterogeneity um, of clonal microbes? And basically, um, we describe phenotypic heterogeneity as um, when a cell has a certain phenotype um, at a specific frequency, and what we want to um, be this phenotype like is... Um, I don't know why it keeps on happening. I'm just letting it jump ahead if it wants to. Um, sorry, can this be changed? I think it was... Maybe it can be... Oh, sorry. It maybe is like, is it selected on auto jump or... Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why this happens. I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, this is fine. Um, so basically... Um, what we want is um, a distribution of our phenotype that is just um, unimodal, and basically we have most cells um, having the same phenotype producing in the same amounts when we look at bioproduction. Um, the problem is what we usually see, thank you, hopefully this works better, um, is that we have either macroheterogeneity, which can be described as, oh, it still happens, sorry. So it's either macroheterogeneity, um, um, where the phenotype, uh, where phenotypes can be present in two states, in a, um, uh, and um, basically 
show as bimodal distributions, um, or we can have microheterogeneity where um, a trait um, or phenotype is present in a, uh, in a quite big variation within cells. Um, maybe it's easier if you jump. Um, so, um, and phenotypic heterogeneity um, of clone microbes is basically um, often leading to lower byproduction yields um, as um, when we scale up these systems um, from like a smaller scale or if we um, let the cells grow for a longer time um, and uh, induce them to stress, um, usually these small populations are actually outgrowing the, the, large pop uh, the high producing populations because they have um, less resources that they use for bioproduction and um, they can use more resources for um, growth in general. So, um, now I don't want to talk too much about genetic heterogeneity. This is not what we are interested in. I mean, in general, genetic heterogeneity is um, derived by differences in the genome, um, but we'd like to look at non-genetic heterogeneity, which is driven by um, epigenetic events, microenvironment, uh, and microenvironmental changes, such as differences in nutrient availability within a bioreactor, um, differences in gene expression, or cellular noise. Um, and then a few examples for production heterogeneity are, for example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae cell size or protein abundance. And um, we also saw um, from our own uh, research in the lab that there's different uh, bioproducts that have different uh, levels of heterogeneity, such as, sorry, such as um, beta-carotene production in S. cerevisiae uh, or lipid production in Eurovia lipolytica. Um, as well as indigo iodine production in Eurovia lipolytica, as you can see. Um, the beta-carotene, which is autofluorescent, is um, very variable in different cells, um, as well as um, lipid bodies or um, indigo iodine, um, which is the blue dye in the Eurovia lipolytica. Um, so the heterogeneity team has been growing since 2020 um, consistently with uh, multiple people working on different projects, um, such as Davina, who worked on promoter heterogeneity, um, Kian Shabestri, who um, worked on nitrogen source quality. Um, both projects were a little bit more fundamental, and now we um, kind of move into a more applied field, um, looking at uh, uh, using heterogeneity sensors to um, study bioproduction heterogeneity, um, looking at uh, proteomic heterogeneity and cell signaling um, that can optimize uh, bioproduction, and um, studying like um, examples for bioproduction heterogeneity, um, such as lipid production in Eurovia lipolytica. And um, so the first topic I'd like to talk a little bit about in my project is um, heterogeneity on the proteome level. And um, so for now, we mostly study heterogeneity in single cells on a more, um, 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 on a more computational level, on a more um, yeah, overall level using single cell RNA sequencing. And the problem of single cell RNA sequencing is that we obviously have to isolate single cells, do the reverse transcription, amplification, and sequencing. Um, and problems with this is that um, a lot of post translational regulations aren't detected at all. Um, the samples are, are super sensitive, um, and uh, the data is very noisy, and the co coverage is quite low. So there's a lot of problems um, that we can't actually detect what we really want to see. Um, and so what I've done is to use a GFP um, tag collection of yeast strains, with, um, which consists of more than 4,000 strains, and uh, each of which has one specific protein tag with GFP. And we made this collection prototrophic to then um, um, induce uh, different phenotypes by um, moving these strains to, uh, from rich media to starvation media and incubating them for a few hours. And then we've analyzed um, these uh, strains using flow cytometry and microscopy um, to see whether the protein distribution has changed um, using flow cytometry or if the um, proteins redistribute within the cells. And with this, we want to then identify heterogeneity markers, different metabolic profiles, sorry, and um, do target identification for potential targets that we can optimize in our bioproduction processes. And um, so this is basically just the overview of the data um, that we've gotten out from these screens. And what we see is that a lot of different pathways are actually heterogeneous when we um, expose them to stress and different environments. And um, for example, the steroid biosynthesis and lipid metabolism pathway are also heterogeneous. And these pathways are, are quite important for a lot of the biosynthesis um, pathways that we are interested in. So this is quite um, interesting and promising for us to look at. 
Um, and interestingly, many of these targets um, are also regulated by post-translational uh, modification, um, especially by signaling pathways and um, proteins involved in um, yeah, stress signaling, for example. And um, so in my second um, part of my project, I'm basically using beta-carotene as a case study to um, identify heterogeneity and maybe find solutions to actually uh, improve um, the production heterogeneity we observe in beta carotene producing strains. And um, I chose beta carotene because it's quite a simple pathway to integrate into yeast and also because it's autofluorescent so we can nicely track it with, uh, with the flow cytometer and it's yeah, quite nice within the cells uh, producing these nice little um, foci that are actually accumulated in lipid bodies. And um, so yeah. I've done then flow cytometry with this. Sorry for the jumping, it is really annoying. Um, and with the autofluorescence, I could see that after roughly 48 hours, when basically the glucose is depleted in the culture, the cells um, turn to be uh, heterogeneous. And I also saw when I uh, now plot the beta carotene autofluorescence compared to size, that um, this is size related. So basically cells that are smaller have usually much, much less beta carotene levels compared to bigger uh, size, uh, cells with a bigger cell size. So we now argue that probably um, there's a, yeah, a specific mechanism that changes the metabolism of the cell or arrests the cell in a different way after um, the active growth stage um, that then induces this different uh, phenotype of beta carotene accumulation within the cell. Um, and so, because we saw the size uh, difference um, in the phenotype, I looked at different uh, genes that are involved in uh, cell signaling and growth, and um, I deleted these genes um, to see if I can change the heterogeneity phenotype and if I can see, um, yeah, um, improved uh, beta carotene accumulation. And actually, when I uh, deleted SNF1, which is the major um, glucose signaling kinase within cells, I could see um, not only an increase in beta carotene abundance, but also um, less heterogeneity, or at least um, my large population was suddenly much larger. So this is quite promising, and it's um, yeah, quite interesting that SNF1, which is um, sensing that the cell doesn't have any carbon, is yeah, also the, the culprit of causing this heterogeneity. And now, obviously, we don't want to um, delete just SNF1 and use this for bioproduction because um, it's a very important regulator that has a lot of different targets. But we can now uncouple um, the, the signaling pathway of S SNF1 that um, regulates beta carotene bioproduction from SNF1 signaling. And that's basically um, now going to be the next steps of my project. And yeah, with this, I'd like to conclude that uh, bioproduction heterogeneity is widespread. Um, and starvation causes, uh, in many cases, also heterogeneity or triggers, uh, is one of the triggers for heterogeneity. Um, cellular adaptation is often uh, mediated by different cell cycle signaling, protein, uh, signaling proteins. And um, yeah, we can take our data to optimize, uh, to, to engineer optimized strains that are sort of insensitive to these signaling pathways. And with this, I'd like to thank everyone in my lab and uh, our collaborators. And yeah, thank you for listening. And sorry for the slight chaos. Sorry. Thank you, Chinzi. And I'm sorry for the hiccups with the tech. Yeah. I have our apologies. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Chris. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So I, I saw that you have heterogeneity with respect to size and to beta carotene levels. Were those beta carotene levels absolute, or are they normalized to biomass? And if they're not, um, do you think that it is it, it strictly is a matter of cell size? So essentially, if you have product per biomass, is there less heterogeneity along that metric rather than just looking at beta carotene? So um, there's a tiny. Uh, we did actually look at that, and it's still. I mean, the problem of um, uh, the data with the with the flow cytometer of, with the FOX is that there's so much data that if we take two populations, there's always going to be some significance. Um, it is not super linear, the distribution, so you still see that there's like a little bit, um, yeah, a non-linearity if you plot um, cell size to uh, beta carotene autofluorescence. But in general, and when I actually do sort um, these cells into um, 
a low and high producer population. I see smaller cells, and these smaller cells also have usually just one of the foci, so they have uh, much less lipid bodies. And if I then yeah, do microscopy for quantification, I can see a difference um, between cell size and um, biomass and uh, beta carotene levels. But it's, yeah, the, the cell size um, phenotype is definitely the most um, strong that leads to this um, difference in beta carotene levels. Question at the back there. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the uh, talk. <clears throat> I saw that you used the um, single cell transatomic uh, data to show your proteome level change. Um, I wonder whether you think that's accurate because, uh, and also whether you can use single cell proteomics to do that, whether that's more appropriate. Um, so I think we didn't really want to. I mean, obviously, we, we believe that our system has like some advantages to, uh, to single-cell transcriptomics because, yeah, single-cell transcriptomics is quite hard to, to do with microorganisms um, because they don't have a lot of tran uh, transcripts. And, um, yeah, we don't get as much coverage as we want to. Um, and I, I get that, obviously, our system is very different. We look at GFP levels of tech proteins, but I think it's still um, quite valuable because we can track so much more proteins. We have it in live cells, so we can really look at it um, whilst it's happening and not um, just um, yeah, after like the purification and after um, sorting of single cells. Um, and we actually saw that in a lot of the proteins, um, the data is very consistent. So we did um, compare it to transcriptomic data sets, and we do have the ones that are heterogeneous in the data set um, from, that were published with transcriptomics. They are very um, identical to what we see with the proteomics um, in some cases. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's just sort of a very nice adding to, to the existing data. Yes, in, because we are running a little bit late, and, uh, so, so that we try to get back on time, could we please thank uh, Chinzi again <laughs> for an amazing talk? Thank you. Sorry, I think it was our fault. If you could leave the mic here, Chinzi. And could I invite um, Jose Jimenez uh, Zarco, who's a uh, reader in synthetic biology in the Department of Life Sciences, who will present to us on engineering bacteria to eat plastic. I, I've got my own. I think, yeah, it's working fine. Um, can everyone hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm going to switch gears slightly. slightly. Um, I'm, we, did, as, uh, uh, we just introduced the reader in life sciences, and my group has a strong focus on synthetic biology or engineering biology applied to um, environmental problems. So what I want to present today is some of the work that we've done related to trying to use microorganisms or enzymes to break down plastics, and this was in the context of a European project. And the first thing that I want to do is to introduce the two main responsibles for all this work, uh, who are Alice Banks and Umar Abdul Mutalib. Both of them left my lab, and actually Alice was meant to give this presentation today, but she just she left two weeks ago. She took a principal scientist position in a biotech company, which is very exciting. So I'm going to do my best to uh, give the same presentation as she would, although I'm pretty sure it's not going to be as good as she would have done. Anyway, uh, moving on, I don't think I need to convince anyone about um, the issue that we have with plastics. We have a problem with plastics. Uh, we are making lots of them. Uh, and what you have in here is just a picture, it's a projection of how much plastic we expected to make by 2050 if we keep business as usual. Uh, just to give a sense of perspective, uh, most, more than half of the plastics that have ever been produced were made between the year 2000 and 2020. Okay. Um, the problem with plastics is, yeah, we, we make a lot, but also it takes for them ages to degrade in the environment. So they are not biodegradable at all, and actually this has created a, a great environmental concern. And about, uh, yeah, five years ago, almost six now, uh, there was an issue of National Geographic um, trying to raise awareness about this problem that sadly came wrapped up in a few layers of polyethylene film, but that's a completely different story. But since then, uh, many people have tried to make an effort to, 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 find out, to find solutions for the plastic problem. Now, 
the other thing that I want to mention is that plastics are very completely different animals. So when we talk about plastics, it's not just one type of polymer. Actually, we have many types of, of polymers that we use on a daily basis, and they're all different. By different, I mean their chemistry is different. And this, is a, this conditions greatly whether they can degrade at all or not. So um, we have different types. If you see in the news that there is a new enzyme that breaks down plastic more efficiently, I'm almost certain that it's going to have to do with this one here that is called polyethylene terephthalate, PET, which is a polyester. So the reason why we have enzymes, so this one is very hard to degrade, and my, my talk is actually going to focus on it. But uh, the reason why it's easier than, to degrade than the others is just because of the presence of these ester bonds. So in nature, nature uses esterases a lot for very different functions, and some of them happen to have the ability to break down polyesters, like this one here. Now, for other types of plastics, like polyolefins that have carbon to carbon bonds, the chemistry is so much more difficult that it's really, really difficult to find just the single enzyme that might be able to break down uh, this carbon to carbon bond. Okay, so most of what you see in the news probably relates to esterases. Sometimes we also see news about amidases. Again, breaking down polyamides is easier compared to other types of um, bones. So here I'm just presenting one solution for polyesters, okay? But you may have heard of many others. And actually for some of the molecules, we have really good recycling methods. So this can be mechanical, they can be chemical, some of them are biological. And this one example of them, uh, there's a company called Carbion France who have developed the technology to break down plastics like PET enzymatically, and this works at an industrial scale. Um, and again, you may have seen some of this in the news. So they use this enzymatic process to break down the PET, get the monomers, and then reconstitute them and make fresh polymer. So that's great and it works with plastics that we can actually collect. And for PET in some countries, especially in European countries, we have high collection rates. But I also want to mention that there are lots of plastics that sadly we are unable to collect. Um, some of them are also polyesters. So we use a lot of PET, for example, for making textiles. These textiles, uh, through the process of you know, wearing down, washing machines, etc., eventually end up in wastewater. From the wastewater, they end up being uh, forming part of microplastics that end up in the environment, just maybe through disposal, through sludge, or that can be used as a fertilizer or polluting with uh, different types of, um, of, of waterways. So um, ideally, what we'd like to do is to develop a technology that is able to tackle not only the plastics that we, the plastics that we can collect, but also those that are really, really difficult to collect. And that's why we thought it might be really interesting to come up with some sort of organism that might be able to produce these enzymes that are needed for breaking down plastics in situ. And why not might be able to use the plastic as a feedstock for growth. So effectively, that they could eat plastic. So to our knowledge, there is only one organism that is able to do such a thing. It's called Idionella sakayensis, and it was isolated in Japan in 2016. And what it does is it makes two enzymes that are called PETase and METase um, that are secreted and break down the polymer that releases the two monomers that, that then can be assimilated by the organism. Now, the problem is that this organism does so with very low efficiency. Uh, and actually the organism is really picky and it's difficult to work with in the lab, not to mention that it's almost impossible to do any sort of molecular engineering with it. That is at the end of the day what we want to do. We want to improve this process. And therefore, we set on the task or, of trying to engineer microorganisms that ideally should be able to do the very same thing. And this is what I'm going to try to explain next in not so simple steps. So what we want to do is to generate a microbe that can make these enzymes that break down the plastic. Uh, the plastic generates the two monomers, and then they are assimilated by the microorganism as food, and then can grow on, on them. Now, there are a few hurdles that we need to overcome. So the first one is we need to be able to have organisms that can use either or both of these two substrates for growth. The second issue is we need to engineer efficient secretion uh, of these enzymes outside of the cells. And for those of you that work with front negatives, you may be aware that it's really difficult because they are not great secretors of pretty much anything. The third step is we need to find an enzyme that is active enough 
in the concentrations that they are being produced by the organism and in the conditions in which the organism has to grow in order to break down the plastic. And finally, and this is crucial, we need to be able to find the plastic that can actually be degraded. And not all of them um, are, is possible to break them down with, with enzymes. Um, therefore, we need to identify pretreatments that are good enough to support microbial growth. So the first step was kind of easy. We just went on campus and we isolated microbes from different environments using traditional microbiological enrichment. So basically we take the chunk of soil, uh, we put it to incubate in the presence of whatever uh, molecule we want the microbes to use as the soil carbon source and we wait. And if we wait for long enough and if we do that several times, we end up with a few of them. We isolated the whole collection. All of them are able to degrade either one or the other. Um, of the components of PET, some of them can actually take both. Um, and you have some examples of them growing on terephthalate or ethylene glycol as soil carbon sources. We like a lot these ones here that are pseudomonas because these are organisms that we know how to manipulate very well in the lab. Um, and again, you have an example of how that works here. So ideally, we want to not only be able to take the plastic as carbon, but if we could transform that plastic into something else of value for biotechnology, it would be great. So what we do is we take the biolacin, biosynthetic pathway, and biolacin is a molecule that gives this distinct purple color to the colonies. Uh, it has antimicrobial or anti-tumoral properties. For us, the important thing really is that it's purple, and then we know if things are working or not very easily. And then if we plug those genes into some of these organisms, and we have two of the environmental isolates here, what you can see is that um, the terephthalate, represented in yellow, can be consumed by some of them, and in exchange, we get some of the purple production, which is great news. Okay, so microbes is sorted. Next step is to try to engineer the secretion. And this was a bit of a challenge, so it took us a while to find out what is the right way of doing it, but eventually, we found the secretion leader that can be cloned just in front of each of these enzymes, and then if we grow colonies of the microbes, and we grow them in the presence of a mock substrate for PT. It's another polyester, but it's slightly soluble. It's called polycaprolactone. If an enzyme is active and it's being produced, then we should see clearance halos around the colonies that you have represented here. So our favorite one is this called PHL7 because it's with the one that we can get the highest activity in these particular conditions. So, so far, so good. Now we can secrete the enzymes. Uh, not all the enzymes are equally active against the substrate, and actually some of them are not active at all. And that's what, that's what brought us to change the assay completely, and then instead of using polycaprolactone, we switched to something that is slightly easier to degrade for all these enzymes, that is called pyrinitrophenylbutyrate. What matters is when the enzymes break down this molecule, uh, they're really something that is yellow, and we can monitor very easily. And what we decided to do was a side-by-side -side comparison of all the enzymes being produced just by E. coli and taken from the culture supernate and no purification involved or anything like that to see under growth conditions which one is going to be the most effective for us. And again, we did all those assays for different temperatures and for different types of enzymes. Some of them come from thermophilic organisms. Some of them have been described in the literature. But some of them have been designed by artificial intelligence, like these fast petes that you have in here that again made the news not that long ago. And in their results, once again, PHL7 is the best. Uh, and now that we know which one is the best, is the one that we can carry forward for the next step. <coughs> the next step, super important, that I mentioned at the beginning is the pretreatment. As I said, Plastics are very different, but even the way in, we, in which we use these plastics to uh, feed the reaction is important as well. So we tried a few uh, methods, and we ended up with four of them uh, to try to determine whether they're good substrates for microbial degradation or not. So we tested films that are completely amorphous. One of the problems with plastic is that if they're very crystalline, they don't break at all. So this is amorphous PET that we can buy from a company. We cryo mill this PET, and this is equivalent to what is used in the industrial process. We also sift this cryo mill PET to try to get even smaller fractions that should have a higher surface area exposed for the enzymes, and this will be representative for microplastics in the environment. 
and we took some bottles and trays from the supermarket, so this is post-consumer PET, and what we did was dissolve, we dissolved them with an organic solvent that I'm not allowed to say what it is yet, uh, because it's been patented by some collaborators, but effectively what happens is as a result of this dissolving into the organic <laughs> solvent, uh, we end up with a very rubbery, very thin PET formulation. Now, if we once again repeat the enzymatic breakdown of all of them, we get the results that you can see in here. Um, the colors of the bars represent uh, the different plastics used in the process. You have the different enzymes, including the controls here in the upper part of the plot. And the height of the bars represents the amount of tereftalate that can be released from the plastics. And in the results, there is a very clear difference between the solvent-treated PET, the red bar, compared to the others. Actually, after three weeks of incubation, we can barely detect anything coming out of the standard PET plastics. But for the pretreated one, and especially working again with PHL7, we see a release of tereftalate that is in the millimolar range, and that's good enough for the microbiologist in the audience to try to grow microorganisms using PET as the soil carbon source. So once that we know, then we try to put everything together. We combine the best pretreatment, the best enzyme, and the best <coughs> microorganism. And then we did growth assays using PET as the soil carbon source, and you have the results on the screen right now. Uh, the red line represents the culture of the microbe when there is no pet. The blue line represents the culture when there is pet. Uh, here we record how efficiently the microbes grow. Uh, this is just for the microbiologist. Again, it's a way of monitoring growth. And what you can see is that there is just a tiny difference. So if you've done this experiment, you know that this increase is not impressive. So doing everything the best that we can the increase in biomass that we can get is about 2, 2.5, uh, and, and that's about it. So Alice wasn't very, hip, very happy with these results and repeated the experiment about a thousand times, um, and I'm showing the results on the screen as well. So this is the increment in OD comparing with and without plastic for the anti-plasmid control, and this is when we have the proper enzyme, so there is a modest increase, but this modest increase is real. So doing everything the best that we can, this is all that we can get. So just to conclude, um, this work demonstrates by combining pretreatments, um, systematic investigation of what's the best enzyme, uh, and using the best microorganism that we could find in nature, well, at least out of the ones that we screened, uh, we can get a modest petrophy. So this is what people like to call using PET as the soil carbon source. So as a bottom line, if you are worried about plastic eating bacteria released into the environment and eating all the plastic, I'm sorry to tell you that's not going to happen anytime soon um, based on the results that we've got so far. But if there is something that nature does very well is optimizing things by using evolution, so who knows in the future, but as of today, I wouldn't be too worried. So I want to finish just by thanking all the people in the lab that you have on the screen at the moment, uh, our sponsors, and of course, you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for an awesome talk. Do we have uh, time maybe for one question so that we gain some time back? A question at the back there. Um, hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you had per thought about performing some mutagenesis, mut mutagenesis studies on the PHL7 enzyme, which it was, is that the wild type or is that it's a mutant? Yeah, that's the wild type. The only thing that we've done to it is to um, engineer the secretion leader, um, but we haven't done anything else to it ourselves. Our collaborators that discovered it in Germany have done some evolution, some directed evolution studies, but we haven't changed the sequence that we originally got. But yeah, there's potential to make it even better, hopefully. And um, second question is quite often with uh, 
enzyme, plastic degrading enzymes, they are quite insoluble. Uh, did you do some sort of modification, like solubility tag or something, to try and solubilize them if you're just using the overexpressed cell lysate for these degradation studies? Um, we haven't done any modifications to them. Um, to my knowledge, they're purified as they are overproduced in E. coli, uh, but that's not exactly what we wanted to do. Actually, in our plasmids are, the expression levels are moderate uh, because we want them to be secreted outside, uh, not so much to purify from the inside. So we are using just as they come out of the cells, effectively in the supernatants, whatever concentrations we get. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can I ask uh, everyone to thank uh, Jose once more? I'm sorry to cut you a little bit short. And can I invite uh, Claudia Contini, who's a, a lecturer in, um, in, in life sciences, in biotechnology and engineering department. And uh, she, significantly to us, she's also a L'Oreal Women in Science awardee from 2022. And uh, she'll tell us, she's our invited speaker for this session, and will tell us about synthetic cells from soft matter to cell-like behaviors. Thank Over you. to you, Claudia. Thanks. Is it working? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Claudia, and uh, I am a new PI in uh, the life science department. And uh, I just started my group uh, next year in November, so I'm a new PI. I'm uh, very happy to start this new adventure me with my amazing research group, which I will acknowledge uh, at the end of the presentation. And uh, so what we are doing uh, in my group uh, is uh, something different from what you heard before uh, in, uh, in the previous presentation. As my title say, you know, says, I'm a lecturer in engineering biology, but what we are doing is actually to create uh, cell mimics. So we take inspiration from nature, from, from cell, and we create uh, our uh, synthetic uh, uh, biomimic system. And in this presentation, I will give you just an overview of uh, the research vision, why we want to mimic something that already exists, and also some uh, project, uh, successful project that are at the foundation of my research group, and also a, a very short overview of all the projects that we currently are carrying out. And if you like anything that I'm going to say, please feel free to ask any question, to reach me out during the, the, um, during the event, but also to send me an email or contact me um, uh, uh, via email or, or Twitter. Okay, so we mimic uh, nature, but why are you mimicking nature? So this uh, is exactly the same question that I was asking my father that uh, was uh, painting what uh, was uh, exactly already there in front of his eyes. And uh, I was not understanding why he was sp spending uh, so many days, months, uh, to actually try to mimic, reproduce uh, that something that he could get with just a camera or uh, was uh, just uh, there in front of us, we just uh, needed to open a window. And what he told me, his answer was very simple. He just told me, sit down here and look, it's beautiful. And what he actually I think that he meant is that uh, only when you mimic nature, only when you try to reproduce it, you can actually understand its complexity. And uh, because you can understand uh, its uh, all different details and all the different comp components that make nature as, as we know it. And uh, so science, you know, nowadays scientists are basically like artists, we take inspiration from nature and, uh, and uh, scientists that can make uh, mimic uh, useful things. So we can create uh, synthetic hearts, uh, synthetic uh, hands, uh, synthetic animals. And all of this uh, is not only to challenge, challenge and science, but also uh, to create a new biotechnological tool okay, that uh, can help, uh, uh, can be useful for a, a real world uh, application. But this is not uh, a new trend in science. Uh, scientists have been always uh, taking inspiration from nature. For example, Leonardo da Vinci, 500 years ago, was uh, observing how birds fly and was uh, translating that uh, biological observation into engineering tool that were going to allow the man to fly for the first time. 
And uh, over the year, science evolved. So we pass from the ornithopter to the Antonov, that is the world's largest aircraft. And in doing so, in this evolution of science, actually help us a new, of new way uh, of locomotion and uh, uh, allow us uh, those new ways that before were completely unthinkable. And actually, in this evolution, we learn how to perform better than nature. In fact, in a normal flight, uh, London to Sardinia, we are already flying in a three times faster than the bird with the greatest uh, airspeed velocity. And all of this started just a mimic in nature. So I've been told that in St. Kensington, I will not have enough space uh, to fit an Antonov. So we are not working in macro scale, <laughs> but we are going to work uh, in more micro and nano scale. So if we look at this video, this is actually an example of uh, high sophisticated behavior that we can find in nature. What you are seeing is a, a droplet of human blood, the spherical static object are our, 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 our uh, red blood cells, the black dot moving around are bacteria, and the, the large cell, sorry, I'm going to replay it, the large cell that you see there, it's uh, our immune cell. So our immune cell doesn't have any eyes, but what it does is uh, moving uh, to a specific uh, direction, uh, and uh, what it does is uh, translating the chemical signal, specific chemical signal that come from the bacteria into mechanical motion. And this is a process that is called uh, chemotasis, and it's part of our immune system, but also take part in tissue growth and so on. And uh, so imagine now to create a, a synthetic version of that system. So an, a synthetic cell capable of a directional or autonomous motion in our human blood. Well, it will help us uh, to do different things. So first of all, to understand the challenges of the motion in biology, and also for an engineeristic point of view, which are the minimal set of compounds that require uh, um, that lead to the motion of a nano or micro object in a physiological environment. And also we can translate that knowledge to create new biotechnological tools that will help us to have smart, active drug delivery, so a system that specifically go is attracted by a specific chemical signal and move directionally to that specific target. So in that case, we get rid of all side effects. And then we can use the system also for biosensing because we have a performance that is activated by a selective biomarker. And also we can create a smart material because if we think of engineering collective behaviors of a motile system, then we can control the assembly and disassembly. So how to do that? Well, in my group we use uh, what is called bottom-up synthetic biology approach. So we create our uh, synthetic cell, or um, probably it's more correct calling them a minimum model system or cell-like system. Uh, we create them from scratch, so we take uh, molecular tools, we uh, control their chemistry, physical chemistry, we self-assemble them together, and uh, finally we have our minimum model system that can mimic the cell structure, function, and properties uh, of cells. And uh, um, in my lab specifically, we, can, uh, we use uh, any molecular tools, so we, don't, uh, we are not restricted to biology, we are not uh, trying to reproduce the original of life, but we are going to use any molecular tool available to mimic uh, 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 cellular behaviors. So in this way, we use uh, biological parts, but at the same time, we can use, uh, for example, synthetic polymers or inorganic nanoparticles. <coughs> And after we create our system, well, we play around with the soft matter engineering, and uh, we can create uh, smart materials, as I said before. We can also use them for bioremediation because the system is capable to translate a signal from the environment. We can use them, uh, again, for drug delivery and sensing, and also will allow us to understand which is the minimal set of compound that lead to sophisticated behavior. And this is because uh, 
I mean, for everyone that works with cells knows very well that the cells are very difficult to manipulate and to understand because even if they are considered a unit of life, they are actually very complex. And in a minimal system setup, instead, you have a system that is 100% controllable. You know exactly what is in there, and you can study uh, which molecule, which signal path pathways uh, participate to um, one specific event or cell performance. So when we want to mimic the cell, if you look at the scale, one of the first steps to mimic a cell is to achieve a degree of compartmentalization. So we need to, to protect the internal environment from the extern external environment. There are different ways to achieve that. What my group uses are mainly two molecular uh, tools, the lipids and polymers that are amphiphilic. So they have an hydrophilic, hydrophobic part. We control the chemistry, how they interact one to another, and the supramolecular interaction. And at the end, we have our minimum model system or vesicle, liposome, or polymerosome. And when you engineer the soft matter, then you can start controlling interesting parameters. For example, we can control the morphologies, can be spherical, shape, or multi-compartment. We can have uh, different architectures, like layer in a layer, or vesicle in a vesicle. And then we can control an interesting parameter, which is the surface topology, so the surface of organization of our system. So this is exactly how I started my professional career. I was uh, uh, working in bottom-up synthetic biology before knowing that I was working in bottom-up synthetic biology. So I was making my polymer from scratch and uh, in order to make my polymeric vesicles. And what I learned from here is that by controlling the chemistry, the exact chemistry of your uh, molecules, so you can actually control the final properties of your, of, of your uh, um, vesicle. For example, you can control the thickness, the permeability, or stimuli responsiveness. And in this study, for example, where uh, I participated with, uh, in um, uh, collaborating with uh, Teoni Group in the material department, one of our students was synthesizing um, uh, three block copolymer, and where the hydrophobic block was of different length, and at the end we obtain membranes with different thickness. And this is actually an interesting parameter because if we modulate the thickness, we can modulate the membrane elasticity, but at the same time the membrane permeability. And uh, this is another example where I was using the same chemistry, so it was the same copolymer, to make uh, different morphologies. And this was possible only playing around with the physical chemistry. Uh, in, in this case, the uh, amphiphilic copolymer had uh, two parts, one hydrophilic and hydrophobic. An hydrophobic part has a tertiary amino group that can be protonated and deprotonated. So if it's, a fully, if it's protonated, the chain is fully hydrophilic, there is no self-assembly. If it's deprotonated, then you have the self-assembly and the formation of self-assembled structures. And uh, this amino group as a PKA, they change with temperature in a way that decreases when the temperature increases. So if we solubilize this polymer at a pH that is lower the PKA, and then we slowly increase the temper of the solution, we, actually, we can actually see the formation of different uh, self-assembled structure. So we have the nucleation from micelle to spheres and then uh, to what we call the I-genus structure, but you can call them also pretzel as you like. And, uh, and this uh, morphological change is uh, actually, um, uh, is possible to characterize using different uh, techniques, uh, NMR, uh, calorimetry, and so on. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, another parameter that we can control, as we said before, is the topology. How we do that is uh, mixing uh, two um, Amphiphile, they can be two copolymer, two lipids or lipids and copolymers together. They have a different molecular weight, they have different chemical physical properties. They mix together and over time we can see the formation of domains on the vesicle surface. 
And this is a very interesting parameter because uh, uh, we can not only create a uh, uh, user domain selective functionalization strategy, but also we, uh, the final structure will incorporate the properties of two membranes. So, so we have uh, two different permeability and two different stimuli responsiveness. And all of this is fantastic, but if we think a real world application, this will be already enough for a drug delivery system. In this study, for example, we, already, uh, we tested uh, different uh, shapes of assemblies from sphere and tubes, and what we saw, for example, uh, that uh, uh, when uh, the cell uptake happens, uh, the tubes uh, causes uh, uh, enhanced metabolic stress uh, in cell compared with uh, uh, spheres. And so once we engineer our minimal model system, then we can use it uh, uh, to understand uh, um, biological properties. So for example, the membrane biophysics, or how the membrane interact with external objects like proteins or inorganic nanoparticles. So in this study, uh, we are investigating uh, the um, interaction of different proteins that are different by molecular weight, but also hydrophilic, hydrophobic profile, and how they interact with uh, polymeric membranes of different curvature, so micelles and, uh, and spheres. And what we saw, uh, we are seeing is basically the proteins interact more with micelles, and this is an interesting effect because uh, a protein a corona, uh, it's uh, one of the challenges that need to be overcome in order to create a drug delivery system. And, uh, and the reason why they interact more with micelles instead of spheres is because uh, at the point of contact, a protein with spheres, the grafting density is very high, so the polymer creates a um, sterical engombrance for the protein to interact. Instead, uh, in, uh, for the, uh, for the micelles, uh, there is more space of interaction and the protein can uh, enter in contact with the core of the uh, structure. Uh, another... Uh, um, Interesting part is uh, understanding how inorganic nanoparticles interact with membranes. Uh, so as I was telling about a microplastic nightmare, we have also a nanoparticle nightmare because nanoparticles are basically everywhere. Are in our food, in our cosmetics, uh, and uh, also in our, in our future with the nanomedicines. And even if they are terribly useful, we don't know their long-term effect in our body. If we, if we think about the multiple ways they can enter in our body, well, uh, there are many. So one of the first toxicological steps to investigate is how actually inorganic particles can interact with membrane and if can actually penetrate the membrane. And uh, when a nanoparticle is uh, put in contact with a membrane, we can have uh, three different uh, scenarios, or uh, only one that is a, a sequence of the three. So we can have uh, no interaction. In that case, we have a Brownian collision nanoparticle with membrane. We can have uh, nanoparticle absorption in the membrane, and that is uh, characterized by uh, penetration depth or we can have uh, the full nanoparticle uptake. And this is when uh, the energy of absorption uh, is much larger than the cost, uh, energy cost associated with the bending of the membrane. And, uh, and, and the last part is actually something that happens in real cells without any active transport. It's just a part of the membrane biophysics. So when you have enough absorption, enough interaction, then there is a nanoparticle of full uptake. And uh, this interaction investigated with liposomes, so the minimum model system was a vesicle made of lipids, and I made it interacting uh, with uh, uh, gold nanoparticles of different sizes. And uh, what we discovered is that there were three, two critical radius, so one at 20 nanometer, where uh, um, before that, uh, the particles were uh, aggregating on a membrane surface or being uptaken with a tubulation effect. And then another critical radius around 50 nanometer, where uh, afterwards uh, the nanoparticles were just uh, bouncing on the membrane. And this is because uh, the different interaction will lead into increase of uh, the surface tension and, and, uh, and were interacting much less. But the amazing part of this study is that uh, 
all this uh, collective aggregation, in, particula in particular the um, uptake by tubulation, was only theorized in literature. There were no evidence of this. And, uh, and uh, thanks to the use of the minimum model system, we were able actually to uh, visualize this uh, uh, collective uptake. And another interesting collaboration that I want just to mention is uh, uh, led to a paper in advanced material where uh, basically there were biologists in Slovenia understanding the interaction of inorganic particles with cell lungs. And this is uh, very important if we think that uh, workers in the working site constantly brief in those nanoparticles. So they wanted to check if there was any interaction between uh, these materials and uh, cell lungs. And uh, they asked me, can you help us? Because uh, when <laughs> working with biological systems, they were not sure what exactly was interacting with what and if the uptake was driven by protein or just was a, um, a simple membrane biophysics. So it was a very interesting interaction between a bottom-up uh, synthetic biology and biology. <coughs> so after we, we create our minimum model system, we can sophisticate a little bit more to achieve uh, uh, life-like behaviors. And to be honest with you, one of the behaviors that I really like and I'm really obsessed, obsessed with is motility. So as in the video, creating this synthetic chemotactic system that can, can move to um, target direction. And uh, one successful example of chemotactic vesicle has been realized with uh, um, what we call asymmetric vesicle. So we achieve a degree of asymmetry in uh, our nano vesicle by mixing uh, two different copolymers. So we observe the formation of domains on the vesicle surface. And at the end, the vesicle were uh, um, uh, formed by two domains with uh, the smaller one being the more permeable one. And the reason why we want the symmetry is because in the nano and micro scale, uh, the, um, we are in the low Reynolds number, so the viscous forces are dominating, which means that the water um, creates a resistance to the motion of the object. So you need to have an asymmetric system in order to apply a propulsion mechanism that push the nano and micro system uh, in solution. Plus, we need an external stimuli like a chemical gradient that set the directionality. So here we achieve our asymmetry. asymmetry. And then uh, in this asymmetric vesicle has been installed a uh, um, uh, protein engine. So are basically two proteins that collaborate together in a cascade reaction. And what is happening here is that as soon as the proteins produce a product molecule, they are ejected for the more permeable domains. And this asymmetric distribution of molecules uh, around the, uh, the vesicle set the condition of self-diffusion forensis and motion of the vesicle. And uh, I, I'm going to show you this uh, motion macroscopically. So in this experiment, the Petri dish uh, has been filled uh, with a sample. And then at the center of the Petri dish has been injected the substrate. And what we can, uh, can observe over time is the collection of the vesicle by chemotasis at the center of the Petri dish. Um, I'm just showing uh, this data bar just to be realistic with science to actually make this video took me four years of optimization in the lab. Um, okay, this another motile example has been done in uh, CES lab where I had the great luck to co-supervise uh, Xiaobin, a great PhD student. And uh, what we were doing is using, <coughs> sorry, using an emulsion. made by two solutions. One solution is PEG, a polymer. The other solution is uh, made by dextran. When you mix this solution, you form an emulsion, which droplets are not stable, so you need to stabilize them. And uh, we stabilize them adding liposomes to the formulation. And these liposomes sit exactly at the surface of the droplet. And the reason why is because they are functionalized with PEG, that is the same polymer that is in the continuous phase. And there is actually an optimal concentration of PEG that allow for the vesicle to sit at the interface. And then uh, when uh, to this solution, uh, with this emulsion, we add the dextran, we just uh, see the, the vesicle merging with the main droplet. 
And uh, when, if we add the peg, we have uh, just a, a um, dilution effect. But if we add water to the system, then we start to see the droplets moving. And if we pay attention about this motion, we can see that uh, it can be divided in two steps. In the first part, there is actually the formation of the asymmetry, which I told you is very important if we want to create a motion in micro scale or nano scale. And then only after there is an optimal asymmetry, there is actually the motion of the droplets. Uh, in, in this case, a way, in case, a way of the uh, gradient. So what is happening here? As soon as we add the water to the system, we create a polymer gradient on the continuous phase. And this uh, causes uh, the migration of the liposomes by uh, Marangoni flow. And, this, uh, uh, and, and as soon as there is uh, the migration of the liposome, then we have the creation of an, uh, another gradient of interfascial tension, and uh, they finally push uh, the droplet uh, um, uh, in solution. Another interesting effect is when uh, two droplets uh, meet. So when uh, they actually collide with each other, uh, they don't have any more the liposome protection because they are already moving. And then uh, there is the merging of them. But during the merging, there is another liposome rearrangement in the surface that stop the motion and only take place again when we have, uh, again, the asymmetry uh, forming in the droplet. And then I'm going to just mention a um, project that, uh, that is about creating a polymer-based artificial cell, and we are trying to engineer dynamic behavior so with uh, polymeric vesicles, and this is a shameless promotion of the poster of my PhD student in the room next, so feel free to ask him any questions. And uh, so we are, uh, we are using a, a, a D-block uh, copolymer that is a temperature sensitive in a way that has a phase and transition from lamellar to hexagonal. <clears throat> and uh, with this uh, polymer, we cre can create beautiful, stable vesicles that, that uh, keep their size even after months, are very, very stable and very easy to work with. And, uh, but as soon as uh, we have uh, um, increased the temperature of the solution, then we have uh, this uh, transition in the vesicle. And what is happening is that <coughs> on the top uh, left, uh, you can see that we don't see anything in the microscope. But then as soon as we increase the temperature, we can start to see the nucleation. And then when we cool down, we have actually the formation of micro-objects. And what is happening in here is that when you apply the temperature, you have the phase transition that causes the membrane deformation. So the, the vesicle in solution, the nanovesicle in solution enter in contact, stick one to another. When there is the cool down, there is the final um, uh, uh, assembling one to another, and then we can form uh, these uh, multi-layer uh, sponge-like uh, uh, microsystems. And uh, those systems are, um, are very dynamic, so if we play around with temperature, we can actually control uh, some dynamic behavior. One of them is actually the fusion in microscale, so even uh, those uh, multilamellar droplet, if we stay just below the transition temperature, it's enough to cause this membrane deformation, as you can see from the surface. And uh, it's not plenty, yeah. So they enter in contact, there is the fission between them, and then as soon as you release the temperature, uh, there is the swelling back uh, and uh, fusion and then a sharing of content. So one of the um, uh, yeah, young uh, uh, part will be actually to, to use this system uh, to activate uh, reaction through fusion, so two compartments that have uh, different contents can actually fuse and activate a reaction. The good is that we can run them also in cycle, so you can run multiple fusion events. If we go instead above the transition temperature, we have another dynamic effect, that is the contractility of the system. So a system that is capable to shrink and then swell back in the original size. And again, an amazing part of this is that when shrinks can release whatever is inside, and uh, when swell back, can trap objects in the external environment. And uh, an example of this is uh, 
uh, an experiment I'm going to show. I'm sorry if you're working in bacteria, you are bacteria sensitive, but I have to warn you that bacteria have been treated very bad in this experiment. <laughs> So I, I was working with bacteria and decided to mix uh, the, the, those particles with bacteria and uh, applying in a heating and cooling cycle. And what you can see is that uh, after doing this cycle, all the bacteria are trapped in, in, the, uh, in those microsystems, micro so effectively cleaning all the solution from the bacteria. And I think that this is a very powerful behavior that can be used uh, um, forward to not only to functionalize our system in a very easy way, but also to detect if there is, a, for example, a selective trapping um, uh, of the external solution. And uh, yeah, and again, a shameless promotion. There are different things that we are doing with the system now, so please uh, feel free to uh, visit the poster. Just to give you a brief, a very brief overview of what is happening in the lab, um, there is a Shuan, it is a, a synthesizing a polymeric capsule with pores, a different shape in nano and micro scale, and we are going to functionalize them with polymers, brush in order to open and close our pores. There is a David in collaboration with Ravinash in infectious disease and that is um, 3D printing layers of droplets and uh, we want to create a sort of a signal pathways between layers. Uh, Nina finished her master and now is a PhD, but during her master um, I was school supervising with uh, Yuval Elani, a uh, PI in uh, um, chemical engineering, and we created hydrogel capable of magnetotastic uh, and deliver a bacteria cargo. Uh, there is a uh, Carina that is incorporating an organic particle with uh, uh, our synthetic cell. Then Max and Sandra. Max is a PhD. Sandra is a master in collaboration with James in chemistry, James Hindley. So we are making hybrid vesicles. Uh, the, uh, Max will move that project towards a motility project while Sandra uh, is uh, focused more in domain selective uh, functionalization. And then uh, uh, Joan is finishing his PhD very soon and uh, co supervising uh, together with uh, Yuval Elani, and we are making biohybrids, so it's a uh, bacteria that uh, has a, is dotated of a, a vesicle coating, and we use this coating for multiple purposes. One of them is to give magnetotastis, but also to shield the bacteria for external components and so on. And then Amanda that is encapsulating uh, bacteria into vesicles to understand if we can have, for example, morphological changes of vesicle with the bacterial activity, but also uh, how bacteria respond to uh, compartmentalized environment. And uh, um, yeah, this is an ask for collaboration. So if you um, are interested in biohybrids, so conjugating biological or synthetic parts together, pl please let's have a chat. And I'm very interested in any way we can complex our system a little bit more in order to mimic more biological structure and functions. And uh, yeah, so this is thank to the funder, thank to the amazing group that uh, um, is with me in this adventure, and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you for this awesome talk. We've, uh, I've, I have a permission from Amparo to postpone a little bit the start of the next session, so we'll, we'll shrink the, I guess, the panel discussion. So we'll have time for maybe two questions, and then we'll have a 10-minute break and then come back. So any questions for Claudia? Hi, uh, um, thank you. Um, I was wondering, with these polymer uh, vesicles, are you able to put proteins in them? Can you have biological molecules interact with them and actually embed in them? What's kind of the, that kind of aspect? Yeah, um, so with, with the polymer, this is the reason why I went also towards a polymer uh, um, Art minimal system is because uh, I want to include a little bit more chemistry. There is, uh, they are more flexible in design, let's say that. And so, yeah, so proteins that can be attached to polymers. 
uh, embedded in a membrane, I guess that you need a protein membrane to do so, and uh, is what uh, Sandran is doing with the hybrid system. So we are incorporating protein membrane, not only the lipid part of the vesicle, but uh, incorporating again the properties of the polymeric membrane in the same structure. But yeah, you, you can do multiple things. And just, uh, we just started, so we are just uh, playing around with the physical chemistry of the polymer to achieve uh, those dynamic behaviors. But if a protein can be useful to sophisticate the system a bit more and achieve uh, any other functionality, yeah, we can do that. Thank you. <coughs> Any more urgent questions? If there are no urgent questions, can, can we thank uh, Claudia, Cinzia, and Jose again for an awesome session this afternoon? And have, let's have a break.